game dev, game programming, Unity stuff, and uh, I guess that's really it. Maybe some game design as well. Going over some really cool tips that Jason's got prepared, which looks pretty freaking amazing. I'm kind of excited for that. He gave us a little sneak preview of it that you, you'll all get to see soon. Um, and then I guess we'll probably take a bunch of questions from the from chat as well. So if you're in chat and you're here, just say hello. Let us know that you're here. Everything's working good. And uh, if you got any questions, feel free to ask them. We'll probably, again, jump into that later. So uh, welcome, guys. Uh, I want to get started with, the, I think, the most important thing, which is that Jason Story has finally created a YouTube video. So his first video is out. I just learned about it this morning, and it's up on his Kofi page or coffee page and I already signed up got ready and I've got it kind of queued up to watch after we finish this stream I'm kind of excited about it and um I wanted to just out uh, I guess can you tell everybody what that video was about real quick what it is that you yeah got sure there? um I, I mean I was keeping it as a bit of a secret I was going to surprise you with this one I, I was going to wait until somebody said you should start your YouTube channel I was going to say I did <laughs> I have it done oh, oh. but um <laughs> but yeah so the the first video was I was so as this is a small side note. Whenever I finish a large project, a large contract or something I'm doing, uh, I reinstall Windows. It may seem overkill to a lot of people, but most of my stuff is cloud-based. I like the sort of mental refresher of starting with a clean thing. And so I, do, I did that again, and I kind of stopped. And before I started bringing back in all the autocompletes and automated stuff and reinstalling everything up, I thought some people might like to know why I set up my machine a certain way. And so I stopped and showed some of that. I showed... Uh, what apps I what what are my like go to apps on a new machine, um, what I'm using effectively and how I use it, and then when I make a new pro yeah I, I saw that thing there we go Aha, I have one so the uh, it it goes through the basics of the way I work effectively how do I start a project in Unity what do I do and one of the main ones is people often ask what if I have reusable code I've got the same chunk of code I want in two or three different Unity projects. Well, there's a way I do that, so you'll see it in the video. It's right now on my Kofi page for the the first week. I kind of wanted to say thanks to people who are supporters on there, um, and then I'll make it go live on my channel, and we'll probably this time next week I'll officially like press the button. So either before or after this video next week. Maybe we we'll do it right after the stream next week. Yeah, so. yeah. Make sure that you're subscribed to his channel though, so you get the alert, or just go sign up on the Kofi page and watch it today, so you don't have to wait. And then I assume there will be other preview videos that pop up on there too. Yep. So may as I've well already got go. a script for three written and one of them is half recorded. I was doing it just before we jumped onto this. Oh, nice. Nice. I'm kind of excited to see what those are like. And then uh, Andrew, what's been going on with you, man? Doing lots of streaming, which is very exciting. Um, as, as, uh, yesterday, I've d I did like nine hours of coding throughout the day. Not straight because I did take a break in the middle. But uh, it's very exciting because I haven't... Been <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I haven't been able to do nine hours in a day in quite a while, so I'm very excited about that. Making headway on the game, and did uh, you feel pretty productive with that? Absolutely. It was. It was. Um, you know, I, I I had my my fits and starts where I got stuck on a couple things, but in general, it just moved forward and it got like just a lot done and um, created a lot of zombie code in the process. So I've got to go back and fix, um, but. It, you know, I've got some sound effects working. I've got some menu stuff working. I've got some new, new, um, just new systems that are working better, and it's it's very exciting. It's a good feeling. It's that good feeling that you get. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, when you get a lot of stuff done and you just feel super productive. I, yeah. I, I mentioned earlier, I was watching it um, throughout the day. I kept seeing every time I would turn on a TV in the house, your stream would pop up, and I would kind of click in for a minute until the kids would tell me to turn off the commercials like i was saying earlier they, they think anything that's not a cartoon is a commercial so they're constantly complaining about commercials i don't actually have any commercials because i think everything's just youtube and i got youtube premium so they watch that and like amazon videos so there's no actual commercials so anything that's got a real person yeah, just gets called a commercial and terrible <laughs> but i i enjoyed your commercial it was good stuff good 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 <laughs> Let's get, um, so there were, let's see, I had a list of a couple of things that I, I wanted to briefly mention and talk about, but I've completely lost them. Where did I put my, um, my list of stuff? I How wanted to ask about the Kofi page. Is it Kofi or coffee? That's what I want to know. 
I always want to say yeah, coffee, I but do. I end up saying Kofi. I, I say Kofi as well. I, I kind of like, it makes sense. It's coffee, but like, yeah, it's a K. Yeah. So it's going to it's be a, Kofi. It's a, right? Yeah. That was my number one question for, for today. So I'm logging off now. <laughs> well, one thing I'm going to put on there at one stage as a note, like I haven't done it yet, but apparently there's there's tiers in the same way that Patreon has. So at some stage, I'm going to do a couple of tiers. And what comes to mind is one of them will just be source code. As I start to make various videos, I'll just put the source code in one of the tiers. And another one I'm thinking about is having some sort of private meetup, if people are interested in that. Effectively, the idea of having people can bring their projects and we can do a an hour a month or something and go over various different, you know, one on one or like, well, with a group of people, like five, 10 people and just go over some of the um, projects and problems and stuff. So I, I, have, I have to figure this out again. I, I have a lot of stuff going on at the moment. I haven't got time just yet, but I'll say watch that space. If you're curious at all and, and want to uh, get involved in that, you can. You can just follow on, on the, the, the Ko-fi slash coffee page either. And I'll let you know whenever I put something new up there. It seems interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes and what, what happens. Yeah. Um, so there were two other things I wanted to make sure that I r remember to share that popped up this week. First was that the uh, game UI database, I've shared this one before. Um, let me just pull it up again for anybody who hasn't seen it. But they added in some features, and I haven't played with them yet, to do some extra searching. So you can actually search across the game UI database for different text now, different types of things that you want to find, um, and, and pull them up, which I thought was pretty cool. So if you haven't looked at this game UI database, it's essentially a bunch of UIs from different games. And I'm not sure where the, the option is in there to, let's see, let's search for like a health i haven't actually played with this thing yet since they added the new feature I just there's actually another it. website that does pretty much the same thing too so after this one i'll show you a second one. Oh, there we go health bar screen types what's what's the other one called uh, interface in games interface in games okay i have to check it out too so these for anybody that hasn't seen these though they're essentially just web pages full of the different uis of games so you can see real examples and get some inspiration. And I find them really valuable because I, I was collecting these myself. Like I literally played like 60 games on my Steam library, taking various screenshots to reference how pixel dense are certain health bars and how much screen real estate do they use and how do they make sure the text separates from the background, various different uh, images and things. It's kind of interesting to see how different games approach it. Yeah, it's... It's really, really helpful, I think. If you want to build, if you have to build a UI, I mean, it's got everything organized by the UI, by the screen, you know, by what part of the gameplay it is. What was the other one that you were mentioning called? Uh, interface in games. This is a really interesting concept. I've, I've not been exposed to this before. And I think I'm going to make use of this. I can imagine just pulling up one of these screenshots in Unity and, you know, as a background to my UI. And you know, yeah. talking about that pixel density and like, you know, how big because that's one of the biggest things is how big should my text be, and I never know. <laughs> so this is amazing. And if you, if you want sort of an analysis of this stuff too, there's a great YouTube channel called Snowman Gaming, and they have a series called Good Good UI Bad UI or Good Design Bad Design. I can't remember the exact name. But um, effectively, they take games and they will look at the UI and break down whether the text was used well, the contrast ratios are good, and they'll explain all of these concepts. So that's that's also a really fun one to sort of see games broken down into what's intuitive or not. Nice. Yeah, they're very, very cool. So I'm going to bookmark this one, too. I hadn't seen this one. I want to check it out um, and kind of go through there. I, I'm not building a lot of UIs, but... Every time I do, I, I feel like I need some inspiration and I always struggle. And it seemed like the just, I don't know, the, that update there kind of re inspired me. <laughs> then, then the other thing I wanted to share was um, just related to 2D stuff. Thomas, I saw he released a new course on how to make 2D art, and I'm a terrible artist. So I think I'm probably going to sign up and just go through and see if I can become not a terrible artist. Nine hours seems like something I can dedicate enough time to to see if I can become un. I mean, I, I don't I don't expect I'll be a good artist, but maybe I can not suck at it and kind of get some of the basics down. I found that like when I go to if I'm following step by step instructions, I can do 
mediocre, terrible copy, like bad copies, but you can tell that it's actually the thing. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe going through this, I'll, I'll get the same kind of thing. And I saw he had a had this going on and had a sale for, I think, a couple more days. So I figured I'd share it too and go check it out. Um, yep. I think that was all I had to share. Um, there was another game trailer I wanted to share, but I didn't actually get permission to share it. So I want to make sure that I have permission before I do that. Um, we talked about it in the Q&A call earlier today, but I, I forgot to actually ask if it was okay. So I don't want to pop it up there. I'll, I'll wait until next week. Cool. Um, yeah. So what did you, you guys have going on this week? Anything interesting you wanted to just talk about or dive into? Uh, just one other thing I wanted to mention on that um, uh, design conversation thing. So I'm this is a, a, a big favorite topic of mine. Separately from games, I just like UI and design and all of that. And I found that one of my favorite resources is a website called Dribble. I don't know if you've heard of that one. It's kind of like artists showing off. Think of it like Instagram, but for specifically UI design. Um, it's D-R-I-B-B-B-L-E dot com. It's, it's a weird name. But effectively, if you're looking for inspiration on UI, it's not game specific. It's just UI. But it's a really nice way to just see pretty colors and nice animations and sort of inspire you to make cool UI stuff. I semi-regularly check that out if I ever feel like I'm in a design drought for something I'm doing. Okay, I'm pulling this one up now to UI designs, themes, themes, templates. It's got a lot of Bs, dribble with four Bs in yeah. it. And you can just okay. type in any word, right? In, in the search box, you can just type in game or mobile app or shop or whatever, or health bar sometimes. And you'll find like different things. And it's a great way to look at um, how different fancier artists than myself are approaching the problems. Where's the search box? Ah, right there. I've got it. Okay. I'm blind. I had trouble finding it too. So I think I had design. to hit this thing to make it pop up. I had to hit the yeah, I, I, yeah. It's funny for for a website about design, it's not super good. <laughs> but I do find that um, this and Pinterest are really good resources in general for um, you know just just looking at at art effectively. I hadn't thought about Pinterest as an option too. Huh. I find Pinterest is a great place to uh, resource for concept art when you're looking to just get some concept art to send to a modeler or just for your own thinking out loud, Pinterest works really well for that. Zoom us back up. Yeah, I, I like to use it for uh, looking for inspiration for the background and stuff. <laughs> right? like, yeah, I, I did the same thing. When I, when I designed this office backdrop, I went on a huge thing on Pinterest and I set up like the, because I don't know if people are aware of this, but the the whole Ikea community there's like there's something called Ikea hacks and they're people who take things that are not meant for different purposes like a kitchen cabinet and side tables and they'll hack them together to make a much cooler table right for for their desk or something and so there's a lot of really interesting inspiration where people will take the Kallax shelves behind me or something else and just make cool side tables or different shelving units and so if you're trying to design how your office should look it's really good inspiration to just take a dive down Pinterest and save a board full of it and look through. It's pretty much what I do. I get on there and like on uh, Etsy looking for weird stuff to, to put back there. But most of the things I just find locally. That one, that shelf though, you can kind of see it there, up there. It's all customized. It was uh, on Etsy. It was, I'll have to do a video of that thing. It's it's like big and pretty neat. And it hides all my wires. I, I needed something to hide all the wires running up to the ceiling to to deal with all those lights and stuff. So <laughs> it, it handles the job. Um, there was a question in here about marketing. I thought we probably hit while it's there. And it said, speaking of Thomas's courses, do you think the marketing portion of his game dev course is valuable for learning how to market a game? I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, definitely. You need, learning how to market a game is extremely important and extremely difficult. I don't think there's a lot of information out there on how to actually market a game and sell a game. There's there's probably a lot more information on how to build games than there is on how to actually market them, get them out there and sell them. I think there's also less information on there out there about how to make them fun and interesting. There's a lot on how to code them, how to make them functional, not a lot on how to make them fun, interesting, or um, get them sold so that people are out there 
actually buying it. And I mean, I think Thomas has got a good amount of experience doing exactly that marketing games and selling his own stuff. So he's got some, he's got some yep. good advice in there and just good general tips. I think I, I will say that's what I did appreciate. Um, like his art stuff is very cool because he's good at art, but I'm, I'm never going to be an artist. So I looked at that as like a fun mental exercise, but there is no way I'm going to practically try to make the art for any of my own projects. I'm not a masochist, but the um, marketing stuff is just useful information. Now, I know people who have put out games on Steam and stuff, so I've heard a lot of similar things from them than what he covered. But I will say what I did appreciate is in Thomas's course, he has an actual like battle plan. Like not, not a theoretical, these are nice ideas. It is when you're ready to release your game, X number of weeks before you do this, then you do this, then you, you reach out to these different places and operations, you set this up, and then when you're ready, you do a launch where you put X social media things out every X number of time until the release and you aim for the, you know, it's like a really clinical approach to putting your game out there. And um, whatever you might say about the cost, if it's if it doesn't seem like it's worthwhile to you, if you have a game and you're about to launch it, spending a few hundred for what could very, very easily triple your sales numbers is quite a small amount. Whether you care about the rest of it, whatever, but if you already have a game, you're about to release it, and you've got like six to eight months till your launch window, I mean, it's very hard to deny that's a good value. Like, it just, it'll just it give you a lot of, even if it's just, I've never done this before, I don't know how to approach it, just getting a first-hand how to approach that is a very valuable guide. Yeah, it's a, and I mean, I think, I feel like marketing and selling a game is something that people underestimate and undervalue a lot of people will just think they'll build a game it'll be awesome and then people will play it but there's a lot of awesome games out there that nobody ever plays or that people find out about years later right and it just becomes amazing and popular on accident but way more that just nobody ever finds out about <laughs> like majority of awesome cool games like people just don't know exists other than salim nobody knows about them so <laughs> you gotta you gotta sell it you gotta market it and you gotta really um I think promote it is just the best way to put it. And that, that, that part for a lot of us is just not necessarily fun. It's that's work. And, and, you know, so I think, I know I made the mistake of not doing that when I made my first big game, the barbarian, because I just was like, I don't know what to do. First of all, that I didn't know what to do, which was the first thing. So with Thomas's course, that makes a lot of sense just to, you know, go with someone who's done it before and do what they did. But then to actually do it is the other thing because it's not fun necessarily. It's very tedious uh, if you're not into it and you know, you're know you producing marketing materials, you're spending time on trying to make sure every image is perfect, every you know video clip, every trailer is really well done. And those things do take way more time than I think a lot of us might expect. Um, to get to that perfection level. And and it's very easy to kind of skimp out a little bit because it's not, it, it's not even just as well, like getting it done. Like it's already exhausting putting together. Like, for example, do you know how many images you need if you're putting your game on Steam? I bet you don't, but it's actually somewhere in the realm of like eight. Like you need to have different resolutions for the different capsules, for the different uh, thumbnails, for the like, how, like the whole series of stuff. You need the resolutions right, and you need to choose how you're going to frame your art for it. There's all of these different things. That's just like one small thing. But then when you get to things like trailers, like how do you make a good trailer? Like that's a whole different, there's a career of people who are paid thousands to make trailers for games. Like that's that's a whole job. And so you putting together a trailer for your own game, like you're not you're not factoring in how much energy and work and research that takes to do it well. So yeah, there's there's a lot in it. Like the, the whole marketing side of it, there's a reason why there are marketing agencies, right? Some people think it's just shilling projects, but no, like there's like you need to know what you're doing. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah. Yeah, I remember on the trailer side, I remember when we were working on uh VR games, looking at trailers and getting trailers made for the games and the pricing on those like to get a trailer from somebody who made really good ones because you could see the really impressive trailers they were charging anywhere from like 20 to fifty thousand dollars for like a one minute trailer you know to go wow. through your game and, and make the trailer the cheap end was you know maybe a couple thousand dollars to get something that was nowhere near the same quality 
But I mean, they were doing crazy stuff and spending two, three weeks building out a, a one minute trailer and charging. Yeah. And you know, here, here's another thing. Right worth it. I've mentioned this before with, with Derek Liu's channel. Um, if, if you're doing trailers for your game, one thing you've probably never thought about even once is what is the tooling like for your game for the ability to record trailer footage? Do you have a button in your dev tools to hide the UI? Because you don't want the UI elements in every image in your trailer. Do you have a button that lets you free lock the camera? Do you have an option that lets you do various different things or you know, actually work with it in a way that would let you frame? Can you pause the game in a way that doesn't have a UI pop-up? Like These are little things that are not a lot of work, but they're like work you have to put into your game before you can begin to record good trailer footage, before you can begin to direct the good trailer and go down that whole rabbit hole of that extra work. So there is a, there is a lot, a lot in it. When, one thing that um, I think is important to consider as well, especially if you're if you're making your own models and art and stuff, is to record that process for the purpose of a promotional trailer, especially earlier in the, you know, you've got a website up, chances are you're going to have your website up early while you're still working on the game way before alpha where are you going to put it on there right you're going to put concept art if you have it if you're getting stuff from the asset store then you probably don't have it uh unless you buy from me then you have some of it because i've had concept art for that purpose but you know a lot of triple a games they'll have behind the scenes where they'll have a speed thing of a model being made or or you know something being drawn and i think that is very powerful for you know, Kickstarter for your website for all that pre-release buzz. And if you don't record it while you're doing it, you're either going to have to go back and do it again and pretend, or you're going to uh, just not have it. Do you record those too and include those so people can put them into their trailers, like a little sketch of it being drawn Unfortunately, out? I have not because it would cost more for production. Because I pay the artists that that do those work that work and um, the in order to it get costs them extra to... to get the actual source files for different things and yeah and just to get them to record a lot of people don't have the the setup to record um and essentially it's just not something we've been able to do i've i've tried but it didn't work out unfortunately what if you can get them to just fake record their screen for a little bit while they like go go over the existing piece like just with the pens <laughs> <laughs> just like on, on screen record it just kind of fake it out nobody's going to know the difference in the trailer i could do i could do that part they are yeah. layered PSDs. The concept art is layered PSDs. So I could do that part. You just go in and like enable brush. layers and do a little brushing yeah. on there, like half a second of brushing and then cut to the next part. Yeah. Change the hey, colors. You, know, you, know, you, know. you, you can go crazy, right? Take the image into something like Unity, use a photo algorithm to scan the image lines, make paths, then use a shader to redraw the lines. And now you've got an <laughs> automated line drawer. You could pop an image in and it'll automatically go over and retrace the lines. That sounds like a, an asset for the asset store to me. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, that stuff is just really fun to watching. That stuff is really cool when you're in, when you're into a game that's coming up and you see that kind of stuff. It's for me, at least as a, as a user, it's fun. It is worth noting as well. This comes down to the whole marketing thing. Um, it's worth knowing what communities have what relationship to you as a game dev. This may sound like a very weird sentence, but what I mean is, um, there's rules for self-promotion that are different per Reddit or Imager or various different platforms. Even per subreddit, there's often different rules for what percentage of your content has to be non-self-promotion. Um, and then if you do uh, do self-promotion, certain communities are perfectly fine with it. They'll actually upvote it and quite like it and you know help you along. And other ones will just downvote you to oblivion. So you need to know which communities are going to be receptive to the kind of content you're producing. So it's kind of interesting. Like there's a lot of like the Unity 3D community really likes work in progress stuff. If you want to build a community, they love that. But there's other communities where if you start putting work in progress stuff in like our gaming, you they do not like that there at all. You'll get downvoted quite heavily. So it's it's very interesting how that stuff does work really well in the right locations. And that's actually, it, it really comes down to, you have to know your marketing. All right, I'm gonna take a couple questions real quick. If you guys don't mind, there's a bunch been popping up. Uh, the first was just about networking stuff that I don't know the answer to and wanted to say, I don't know the answer to. Busy Steamworks versus Face Punch for Steam networking and Unity. I'm not sure um, 
I've never used either. So I've used Steam's networking a little bit um, and a lot of the other Unity ones, but I've never used either of these. I assume that these are assets or uh, network libraries. I, I wanted to check, though, either of you guys used either of these. No. Uh, well, if anybody in chat has, well, I guess just let them know what, what you recommend. Uh, the next question was about, is there a career for a game story writer? I'm doing freelancing on Fiverr. I feel stuck. Um, there is a career for it. It's extremely difficult to get those jobs, though, because there aren't very many. I've In most of the places that I've worked, the larger places at least, there have been full-time writers whose job was just to write about the game or write story stuff writing a mix of lore, just the backstory stuff for the game, the characters and the areas, and then writing things like quest text um, and just random story related things in the game, whatever it is. Could be the plot of the game. It could be like the main storyline stuff, although that's going to be a kind of a mix of story and design. It's not just going to be a single person writing the story that's kind of coming up with the whole thing. Uh, in the MMOs, though, there were lots of people that just all they did was write story and they didn't do anything else with them um, with the design stuff um but yeah so there there are some jobs in it but it's a way 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 smaller field i mean it's probably like one out of 20 or one out of 50 game designers are doing just the story part and not doing the other stuff my recommendation in general like if you want to do story stuff games is a fun way to do it but um it's it, yeah, it's just it's just tough. Like, there's not a lot of positions out there. If you can do some other game design and story writing, though, it'll be a whole lot easier. And you probably have a lot more fun because you can get your story across with more than just the writing. You get to do some interaction and other stuff there. But I mean, it's it's kind of tough. And um, I wish Salim was here because he probably talk a bit more about just the the design side of it. But you guys have any thoughts on just uh story writing and game design or just the job in general of being a game story person or kind of the the lore person back there i think i don't i mean not directly i'm just thinking out loud that you know it sounds like somebody who's really into writing um would probably do well to also write about other things as well and just like see you know i don't know i'm just thinking like if you want to be a writer then you're going to be writing and write as much as you can like see, see if you can write a novel to go along with the game see if you can write you know text adventures and stuff i'm not sure what would increase the chance of getting a job besides what you said doing game uh, design more traditional game design plus the writing but if you want to focus on just the writing like what's going to increase the chances it's probably having a portfolio showing a breadth of of ability that that maybe goes beyond just games but also includes stories lore you know um tr branching trees quests and 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 uh you know character development all that stuff in a variety of genres i would think but i really don't know I just popped up a comment about uh, Inkle Studios guy did uh, some talks in GDC about writing too. So it might be worth checking out. I'm kind of curious. Um, yeah, I think I've seen some of those, but mostly around the, the tooling of that though. Like less, that's uh, less about the actual, uh, the art of, of the writing. Um, to, to tell the truth, it's, it's kind of a hard line to walk here to say this, but a lot of people want to be writers that there's, there's a, a running joke that everybody has a book they haven't written yet. Like everybody wants to write something at some stage of their life. And then games is one of the most fun hypothetical careers. If, if you don't think about all the work involved, it sounds like the perfect fun job. And so people who want to write for games, that's like a dream job for a lot of people. And so realistically, it's not going to be that easy because it's not really the job people advertise for at least not very often, unless you're on like indie communities and things, because often most people want to make games because they have a game they want to make and a story they want to tell. It, it usually doesn't work as like, I've made everything else, I just need a story writer. Now that's not always true. I do know a guy who literally paid somebody about 10, 12,000 to write a story for his game. It does that happen. That would be me. I would do something like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I, I could build the mechanics. Now somebody give me a story that doesn't suck, please. <laughs> but I wouldn't say it's very common. And I would think that the truth is you're better off. Like 
if you want to get into that, you're better off making your own small itch games and writing impressive stories for them. And then let that be your portfolio of engaging small stories. For example, take a look at Yaxi Crowshaw or, you know, Zero Punctuation. Um, he's a writer. He writes literally books, but he's also made games where he wrote the story for his own games. And he uses that as like the bounce off each other, the, the kind of further himself as both the content creator and the writer. So I think the truth is you can just make walking simulators, just very basic games, but like treat them as a way to tell a narrative and practice your skills in a way that's advertisable. This question says it's for me, but I think it's really more for you, Jason. <laughs> just, if story is going to decompile my published game to audit my am. name spaces, all right, so he's going to, so there's something he talked about before, taking existing games that are built in Unity or other engines and then decompiling them to see how they were built and what they're doing. How do I preserve the security of my high score logging API calls to my website? This is the kind of thing that you have to deal with normally, right? You have to worry about securing these API calls. So do you have a, a tip or some advice or something they could look at for how to get started on keeping that secure so that, and just to clarify the problem for everybody, you've got a game that's calling out to an API to say, hey, this is the new high score. Like you, you played and you got 10 million points and you send it off to some server, some API call, which is like a web API to say this player got this many points and it goes on to the high score leaderboard. If you're decompiling the code, you could theoretically just make that call with whatever numbers you wanted and kind of redo that or run it yourself. So is there a way you can prevent people from hacking and doing that if they want to get in there and become the, the new top scorer by cheating? So the short answer, unfortunately, is no. But there's it's more complicated than that, which is, there's a general piece of advice on working on anything networked at all. doesn't matter what it is, which is never trust the client. The client is generating requests, information, and ideas. So you've written a client and you've written some web backend stuff. Any client anywhere can just say, oh, I, I got 10 billion. That's my score. Just, just save that, please. And so the truth is you can't stop people making those calls. They can look through your code. They can, now, there's stuff you can do. You can tie it to an instance or to a user account. You can generate secret keys on both sides. They have to check. You can generate custom hashes. You can use um, bearer tokens for limited time requests. So if someone tries to call it, but they didn't actively hit the line of code at the right time, they have a small window. Uh, you can do handshakes back and forth to verify that a code is sent back, has to be generated and compared against. There's lots of things you can do, but all of those are just ways of making it harder for somebody to send the request. But the truth is, if someone really wants to, they can find a way to find the line of code you're sending to your own backend and call it to. And if they do that, you can't stop that. But what you can do is distrust the answer you get. For example, if you're doing an MMO and somebody wants to teleport themselves across the map, you can take their last position, take their desired new position. And if it's like 10 times wider than a single move will ever allow a character to move, you know that's a sort of you know suspicious looking movement. So the truth is you just have to assume the information you get from the client is probably going to be untrustworthy. And so the answer is you can't do anything to stop me making calls if I wanted to, but you can distrust those calls and in your server side, do something about that. Is a score coming in infeasibly large? Is Did six calls with high scores get sent within a couple of seconds that you can't physically make those calls fast enough, that's suspect. Just come up with checks that verify that this is an unrealistic behavior for request calls coming in, and then you can flag it and flag the accounts, and you can do stuff that lets you distrust those calls, but you can't stop them. The other alternative or the other thing that you can do for the, the stuff that you have to have control over is just make it all server authoritative, right? Just so that that score is being calculated by the server, not by the client or, or something, or whatever the thing is. Like in MMOs, movement is one of the few things that we actually do the, the validation on to check. And the rest of it is all controlled just by the, the server, Like right? The client's almost like a, a dumb terminal where you pass in inputs and get back things, but it shouldn't do any of the actual, the game logic um, with those things. With high scores though, it's a, 
a lot of the time it's just like a simple mobile game and you don't care about it. And then just the checks are, are probably valid um, and, and more than enough. Yeah, you can do some some testing on that. Or you could also just do, you can check, send in other requests that kind of go along with it that obfuscated a little bit too so that it doesn't go unless they've been playing for a certain amount of time and you got a start game call and you've had updates along the way of the score and stuff. Um, you know, there, there are tell things the truth, you can check. Go ahead. The, the way I would actually solve this, like if it was a genuine question I was building it, the answer is I wouldn't do it myself. The truth is... Steam have their own systems for this. Other platforms have their own systems for this. I would send it to them because those systems have user accounts tied to it. And so if you just send high scores through an API call, it's probably just a keyword for the username and a keyword for the score. Anybody can send any keyword and any score. If you're using something like Steamworks APIs for that, it's tied to their account. And so if someone makes a dodgy score, even if it gets through, you could say, hang on a second, someone's on my scoreboard with a ridiculously high score. I know their Steam ID. I can either delete the score or ban them from making future scores or something. And you have, but if you try to do it all yourself, you'll have a harder time. People can just make multiple calls with different accounts and that kind of thing. So the truth is, if you can get away with not having to do it yourself, somebody has thought about this a lot deeper than you have. So deal, let someone else do that. Yeah, I wonder if I know anybody that's done this in a big scale lately that could could kind of talk about it. Um, other solutions that they've come up with too. I don't know to reach out and just like I'm kind of curious though. See, like uh, if anybody's been dealing with this on their own or something similar where they're at ma- like a large scale and their high score is so something that they they care about and actually getting hacked, or if anybody ever gets this hacked. Like oh, I, I'm curious now. <laughs> I've never had it be a problem so. I'm just wondering. In, in truth, this is a kind of a side note too. This is not really super relevant to the game stuff. But the way you traditionally handle this in enterprise, where it's actually important, is uh, okay. This particular thing can only be received by this other particular thing. So if it didn't come from this network in this location at this URL from these locations here, or by these registered machines, or these something, I don't care. So people can make all the calls they like, and I'll just ignore it if it's not from a whitelisted set of uh, original source locations. There's stuff like that that you can put in place and that make things a lot more secure. Um, but yeah, that's that's a side note. Sorry, I was actually grabbing my book here. As soon as you said not to trust the client, I had to just grab this book because it's all, it's, I mean, this book is just about hacking MMOs and, and hacking games because you can't trust the client because the client will send down bullshit all the time. I mean, and, 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 go ahead. I was gonna say, if you want to actually see this, if you if you've never done this before and you have no idea even remotely how you'd approach it, um, there's something called uh, Pony Island. It's in P W N, as in to pone. You can Google this, and there's an actual MMO where the goal of it is to hack it. Like you literally can't complete it by playing the MMO. But what you can do is break it by sending different API calls and messing with the code. And you can find people online who played this game. You could watch them give the adventure of how they how they reverse engineered the calls, how they made the calls, what they did, how they did the speed hacks, how they changed health, how they had to cause buffer overflows for health bars to make characters die, all these kind of cool stuff. You can effectively find out by looking into this as an actual thing. Like there's entire YouTube channels where people make these hackable MMO games and you can watch how they do it. Sounds interesting. I know it's, it's definitely like fun people. trying to hack them and getting in there, but um, it will get you banned as well. So just be careful <laughs> on, on the other games, at least. Um, there's a question about the framework that uses the game windows. Um, so just like your windows on windows as objects. Um, was there, there was a library for this. I actually think I did a video loosely about this uh, running things. I know I think that might've been the background one. It might have been the same library though that, that read the stuff. But have you seen um, those where you can play like you run around and jump on your different windows and go from window to window? Yeah, and stuff? Uh, I, I have a, I have a library for you. So let me let me link a few things here. So okay. first things first. For on on the previous one, uh, check out this YouTube channel. It's called Live Overflow, and he literally plays these kinds of games. Um, like I said, there's one in particular. Check out his series on Pwn Adventure Three. Um, and to be specific, that is this playlist. If you want to know how MMO hacking works, this will tell you what you have to guard against. Um, 
And that second link is specifically the playlist you want to check out. Okay, I'll pull this one up. All right, so this is the adventure in Pony Island, huh? So, so you, this will literally go through step by step how to effectively hack an MMO. Huh. Interesting. So, okay, this is the MMO you go you go in and hack. Mm -hmm. So you, you go in with no guidance, follow the street, and. I'll have to go through and check this out. Okay, um, here's, and here's then one, the one where they're actually... Is this, yeah, there's the puzzles that you have to solve. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so so on that one, like you, you can actually solve this really tedious um, uh, truth table binary puzzle where you have to hit all of the right switches, or you can basically try to reverse engineer the responses and get back the right one. It's, it's really cool. It's, it's a fascinating solution. Interesting. Uh, and to answer Tim's question, this is the library I was talking about. It's called Desktopia. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So Basically, let you make up. Unity applications that are a transparent window, and then you can query to get the Windows handle information for Windows, and it'll auto-generate collider boxes for 2D over the shapes of the windows for your desktop, which lets you effectively build a game world inside of your operating system. And then you can just move your windows around and... Yeah, you can, you can subscribe to events for either moving the windows, you can open windows, all these different things, and then make a fun game that uses that as a mechanic. Um, if you want to see a game made with this, I don't know where it's linked here somewhere, but he's actually made a game uh, that uses this called um, Desktop Garden or something. This one? Um, there you go. Yeah, that's the one. So there's an actual game that demonstrates this project. Actually, pretty cool little game. Huh. Have to download it and try it out later. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a neat concept. I just don't know, like, uh, it, it's also a very strict limitation, right? Like, you've limited your game to, it has to work with the rectangles on screen and players dragging around, so I guess it, if you can come up with a cool game around it, seems fun. All right, let's stop sharing that and see what else we had for questions. I think there were a whole bunch more that popped up. Yeah, I'm barely getting through them. Oh, it's here. Like a very is, reference happy day. <laughs> I have an Andrew question. When making magic systems for RPG games, how would one go about it? Now, I know that's... somebody yesterday was making a magic <laughs> system, right? That's what that I'm was doing that right now. We were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so it's going to depend on your project, of course. You know, so disclaimer there. But for you know, the the, the base is going to be. You've got all these spells, right? And they're going to do different things. There's spells that will be like an instant cast, instant cast, uh, cast where you click it and it casts, like maybe torchlight or something, right? There's going to be spells that you can cast on your player or your party or maybe an NPC or maybe any of them. Like you know, you have to make the decisions. Okay, if I have a healing spell, can I cast that on any character in the game, or can I only cast that on my player? or my players, if I've got more than one players. Um, then attack spells, same deal. Can I cast fireball on an NPC? So you've got to deal with the types of things that you can cast, what they can be cast on, and that is a lot. <laughs> and then you have to deal with all the particles, all the logic behind it, the buffs and debuffs. So when you go about it, you go about it carefully. <laughs> is 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 i think the the base because there's just there's no one there's not one way to to go about creating a magic system but uh you've got to really think through at the beginning what you want to get out of it what the limitations of the system are going to be and then you know try to carefully design that within the structure of your of your game most likely your magic system is going to touch all the other systems in your rpg you got your stats you've got your conditions for your buffs and debuffs You've got global conditions for things like global, you know, torchlight. You've got your attack and, and battle system with with the spells that can attack. 
those same spells, you know, you got a fireball that you can cast onto the goblin, but can the goblin cast a fireball onto you? And is that the same fireball or is that going to be a different fireball? And if it's the same fireball, then that's going to be a different setup than if it's a different fireball. And maybe you hack it so that it looks the same, but it's really different because your fireball can only hit enemies and their fireballs can only hit you. So they can't accidentally hit another goblin. Depend on how you want to set that up and whether you want a fireball to be realistic that can attack anybody or if you want it to be, you know, like, oh, no, it's only going to hit you. So in yours, how do you store your um, like your magic spell or magic ability data? You want to kind of share that? Do you make a prefab for it, a scriptable object, yeah. some data structure, a text file? How it, what, what are some ways that you'd recommend for that? So I'm using do? a scriptable object. I, I've got a... Um, you know, this is part of the mod the game modules pack that I'm putting on the asset store. Um, and I basically have a, a module there that I call items. Um, that is a list of things. It, it, you know, originally it was for swords and axes and shields, um, but it can be used for any thing that is a list of things. And so in this case, I've got a list of items called spells. I call spells and each item is a spell that has a bunch of data attached to it. So it's going to have things like the cost, the, the flavor text, the name, the um, mastery of it, whether you know this is the heroism novice or heroism expert level. Um, all the details about what it does is contained in that uh, one object, and it's a scriptable object. Um, now, that's linked to the main um, game controller. So during the runtime, I can say, okay, well, this, uh, this, you know, player has learned a spell, and I've got a list of strings, just learned spells. Um, it's just string, so heroism or fireball. And then I can say, okay, he he clicked on heroism, which I've called. You know, I know all the data because I can go to the game controller, say, look up this spell, heroism, and now I have all the stuff I need. So they click on that. Now I know put that spell on deck. Again, it's just a, a string in my spell on deck uh, uh, method that says, OK, there's a spell on deck. And then whether I click on something, it's, you know, I have to look up now whether that something can be clicked on. So um, if it's a healing spell, for instance, in my game, it's you're only going to be able to heal your own party. Now, my party is characters on the bottom, just kind of like 2D buttons. So when you have the healing spell on deck, if you click uh, a goblin, it's not going to do anything because it's going to go through the checks and it's going to be like, oh, party only. Therefore, you can't click on the goblin. If you do, it won't do anything. You can either escape out or you can click on your party, one of the two. Um, but it's essentially just a scriptable object for all the data. Um, that's not going to change at runtime. So it can just be a scriptable object. And then at runtime, um, mostly strings actually that just keep track of of what spell is in what area if that makes okay. sense yeah but they're, no, it, they're it makes sense it's yeah primarily scriptable objects and then it sounds like a dictionary a string based dictionary to find the object and get the data and and use that um whenever the the spell or ability is needed and then that spell that scriptable object i assume just defines all of the different things that it does or those just different fields or like different sub yep. actions underneath there that you attach to that scriptable object or how do you how do you set that up so no actions are in the scriptable object it's all to basically data storage for the for the spell as an object and um you know i use my own dictionary uh class that that comes with the modules as well so it's not a traditional dictionary it's basically a list that of you know what i call dictionaries infinity pbr dictionaries that can have any sort of data on it. Um, in fact, yesterday I added sprites to the to the to the types of data that can be on it. So essentially, I can you know, for any spell, add a new type of information I want to store, whether it be a sprite or a string or an int. I can name it and then provide what values. And each name can have multiple values. So I, you know, it can have only one of each type. But I could have, um, for instance. Uh, um, trying to think of, of one that might have multiple types. Um, cost, for instance. Let's say you've got two different, you know, uh, in a in game where you have minerals and, um, or spell points and gems, right? So or you health. might have, 
right? Or health, right. yeah. Yeah, health has a secondary cost, like your magic points and your health. Yeah, so you might have uh, an int and a float or a string and a, an int. Um, so, you know, cost could be a string health or string magic to de designate whether or not it's a magic or health cost, and then a number for the actual value. So you can just call up, you know, get me the, the value of the integer from cost and get me the string of the from cost and now you know everything about the cost and then your logic you know will will be dictated by however you you code that yeah yeah i mean it sounds interesting i think scriptable objects are are definitely a, a viable and valid way to go um as long as you don't have millions or you know, thousands and thousands of them it's pretty pretty good and pretty manageable and it's easy yeah. to do without any overhead you don't have to add in any extra systems or anything that, that's complicated so it seems like a definitely a good option and if you haven't used scriptable objects you should definitely look at them to kind of like prefabs i mean another option that you could have gone with is a prefab but it sounds like you're storing the data on these scriptable objects and the references to other prefabs like the particles yep. and things right so it's kind of a scriptable object that defines it and yeah. links to prefabs that should do the visuals and all the other stuff what I what I like about the scriptable objects is you can create a clone um, of the object and then you can pass that around inside your game. So you know when I I've got my a sword as a as part of my items and if I want to bring that into the game, i.e. like you know actually give it to a player into their inventory, I can clone the sword item. Um, now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know say the inventory equals because then you're gonna start changing the data on the scriptable object. You don't want to do that. So you make a clone, and now that object is in my game, part of the inventory. I can pass it around, so I can you know move it from the player's inventory into the item that's held. And now you see it on the screen, and it's going around on the screen. And then the player clicks on another player, another character in their party, and I pass that object to the other party. And it's very logical. I love I love how it's it's you know in your head you're actually passing this object to another player. Um, yeah. the, only, the only caveat, of course, you can't serialize all of the, uh, the, the references to, to um, your prefabs and stuff. So you do have to keep that in mind so that when you save that data, when you reload it, you're gonna have to repopulate um, links to the, to the prefabs or to the particles or to the textures. Um, but you can either, you know, it depends on how you code it. You can either relink things as you load, so go through the player's inventory and relink everything, or you can, you know, whenever you you need those things, always call the main scriptable object. Um, right. But either way, it's 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 for me, it's been uh, uh, easier to to visualize and and think about the logic. It's an in interesting sense. technique. So you you're, you're copying the scriptable object. And then I guess that it means that you're holding some design data and some state data on that same object, right? And yeah. then the copies of it have valid state data. The initial one just has the default state data, right? But but I'm assuming they effectively get destroyed at the end of the close. You're not saving that stuff. And then what you're doing is you're re you're reinstantiating it again when you check against what's in the inventory the second time they run it, right? Yeah, so like let's take a take a, a sword, right? Um, it's just a bare sword. It's got the ability to be enchanted, right? To have a, a, a prefix. So now it's a magical sword, right? But when you equip it, it's just a sword. So I clone that that item into the game itself. Let's say the player then casts a spell and now it becomes a magical sword. So now the the item's different from what is in the scriptal object. So I'm gonna save that as part of the data structure when I save and load the game um including all of its changes mm -hmm. but whenever i load up the game all the links to the textures to the game prefabs to the whatever it might be have to be reloaded so the two options there are to either onload relink everything but only the stuff that you want to relink like just code it so that you're going to relink the, the prefabs and, and whatnot or Whenever you need a prefab, just go back to rather than calling the object that you have in your game, but now the magical sword, go back to the main game data structure and call up the prefabs only from that. Interesting. Yeah. Which, which route did you go with? Are you doing the um, load, I, load at once or the lazy? I think load I've one? made the mistake and done both. Um, oh, okay. Trying yeah. To I, 
Well, trying to decide slash when I'm just doing it, thinking, oh, I'll just do this, and then realizing, wait, I did it wrong, and and having to go back. Um, yeah. My my, I think, you know, if I had to to do it from start again, because I'm pretty sure in my in my project I've got both ways. But if I had to do it and start again, I would probably say go to the original data object for those things. However, um, it is convenient to just to to not have to worry about that and just keep it on the object itself. And just you know, if you're if it doesn't take much time to load the the data, I mean, you know, on the loading of the data, it's it's not that big of a deal. Um, so right. really, yeah, I guess when you load it, you could just go through, look at the original object, and assign those references, right? Yeah, just copy, yeah. Copy the references out of there. Yeah, um, it just it just throws you know it throws you for a loop sometimes when you realize you made the mistake and you forgot to copy a reference and then you load your game you're like wait why is there a bug there was no bug here yesterday and that's because yesterday you loaded it and it was already there so while you're playing the game it's yeah. there but then you load from a save and you're like where the heck is that what what that's missing that makes no sense no code yeah. change and the game stopped working just because you yeah. what the hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that literally happened to me um, yesterday. So, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I think it's interesting. Uh, if people want to see more on that, they just subscribe to Andrew's channel too. He said yesterday yep. he did a nine hour stream or nine hours of, of coding on exactly yep. that kind of system. So you could actually yeah. see the underlying and, stuff he's talking about and see the actual code. Yeah. And after Andrew. this, I'll be doing some more live streaming on that and probably working with that system still. So, oh, nice. Right after the stream? Yeah. I think it's uh, scheduled for 12.05. Perfect. So everybody can uh, hop on over to that one right after this too. We'll have to link it. Um, there was a question about releasing your game without marketing. Is there value in it thinking about releasing the first game just for experience and not for profit? Sure. Without a doubt. I mean, if, if you don't expect that marketing is going to make a big difference or you, like your plan isn't to really push the game and have it be some big commercial success, then yeah, without a doubt, just getting it out there, releasing it going through that process, extremely valuable for the experience. You're going to get way better at it. And just for um, the ability to talk about it, share it and get jobs just with the fact that you've done it. But I mean, also just going through that process is important and you can always market the game later. It's just that the earlier you market the game, the better, right? The sooner you get that out, the more likely it is to be a big success and be you know, financially good and profitable doesn't mean that you can't market it after the game came out or that you can't you know, release the game and then work on it for two more years and then start marketing it. Um, yeah, just uh, at least that's my my opinion on it. I, I'd say release it, get it out there. Yeah, yeah the, the most valuable part is the finishing it. Um, but I would say if you are making a game, like part of that process is learning the marketing because if you don't do it and then you do have a game you actually want to market, you don't have any experience and you're doing it blind effectively. So if you are making a small game, I would say at least try to market it. Like you don't have to go crazy with it, but at least, you know, put, just do a bit of research, put some articles out, do do a couple of tweets, just kind of get the basics going. The reason why it doesn't just make you better at marketing, it has a second benefit, which is if you do market your game, you build a community. You build a community, you have more people playing it, you have more people playing it, you've got more people debugging it and having opinions and helping you make a better game. And then your game improves and your knowledge about what makes a good game improves. So marketing is more than just about, I want to make money. It's about, I want to build a community of people who will play my project. So I would say, if it's not about the money for you, then that's great. It's, it's, it's good that you can still make it just for the sake, sake of education. But I would say the whole, it, it's, they say that the last 20% takes 90% of the time, right? And so the, the, that last 20% of, I have a finished game, at least I think it's finished, but now people are going to find bugs. I have to learn how to deal with feedback from people. I have to deal with it not working on certain machines. I have to have loads of people getting stuck in certain areas I thought were really obvious. People are clipping through the floor over here that I never found. There's a lot of information that's good to learn as part of the learning process that you just won't get if other people aren't playing your game. So you don't have to market for the sake of marketing, but I would say do it anyway just to get more people playing your project. And this question kind of leads right into that on what are your thoughts on devlog videos to help promote or your progress in game? When is it a good point to start making those types of videos? And I think that if you don't want to, even if you don't want to market at all, doing these is still like a, a good form of free marketing that you get 
as kind of a side effect of what you're doing. And I think you get some good feedback along the way too. Uh, how's that working for you, Andrew? You've been doing it really recently. Is the devlogging, um, I mean, I assume it's definitely helping for the marketing, but are you seeing a lot of good feedback and getting some value out of that from having people watching and being in there along the way? Yes, I think that there's multiple angles um, for why it's valuable. Uh, you know, first of all, not that many people look at them or watch them. And I'm currently using the Infinity PBR channel for it, not, you know, a channel directly for the game. Um, but what I've been finding is, first of all, it's just nice to to talk to people and get some ideas from people. And, and you know, they're like literally yesterday I was designing the spell, you know, in the UI and somebody said, hey, you should make a double click. And I was like, you're right. I should make a double click. And they probably saved me, you know, 30 minutes, 60 minutes of work that I would have had to go back later to add that because absolutely it was the right choice. So there's there's the community aspect there that's just it's just fun. Um, there's also, you know, the idea that, hey, if I'm putting it up there, it's going to make me and I think a lot of us are going to be like this. It's going to make me more likely to continue. You know, there have been times where where I haven't done a live stream for two, three months in a row recently in the summer. But um, I felt bad about that because I had done it before and I wanted to do it again. So that that, you know, self shame of sorts pushes you to, to go further. Um, and then the, th the third thing is, you know, just talking to just having it there means that people who are interested in supporting you in various ways can see that you've been doing this can see that you're not just fresh off the block here, that you've been working at it. Now, somebody asked in the chat, you know, how I'm marketing the game. Right now, I'm just doing live live streams. I'm live streaming the production. Part of the production is making assets for the asset store and, and extensions for the asset store. And once I get the foundation done, I can make pretty graphics and stuff. Phase two will be making a Steam page and continuing the, the live uh, developing of the game, but now on the actual Legend of the Stones channel. So all the original stuff will still be there on Infinity PBR, but the more pretty marketing stuff will be on Legend of the Stones and the direct channel for that game. And that's that's my plan at least. Um, and then and then I think with that, I've already gotten at least one third party company that does a tool for games that reached out and you know I talked to them about how they can help me in the channel. And they're eager to promote the channel because I'm using their product and they want to promote me. And I'm like, well, hey, that's a win-win. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if not for making devlogs and making videos showing how I'm using just random stuff. Uh, that's exciting. I got to find out more about that when we're offline. <laughs> I'm kind of curious. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'd say you would recommend people do it right away then or as Absolutely. soon as they have something to show. Absolutely. You can always take down the old crappy videos when, when you're getting more traction and you don't want people to see the, the, the ugly under the hood stuff and you've got better graphics, better intros, better music and all that. Take down the old stuff then. But for now, mine fell off. There oh yeah. <laughs> I was going to bring that up. Yeah. that, that is... yeah. I'll be honest. That picture of you holding that up was in my mind as I was making that video. The last one that I did, I was like, yeah. I, I already listed like 20 things I hate about it, but I was just, I, I was picturing that little sign and going, I'm just going to put it out. Take a, so screenshot. It's a little reminder that it doesn't have to be perfect the first time. Do it. It will get better. It will progress. And yeah, I got, I got weird. You can see like in my background, I got signs up everywhere for all the things to remember what to do. Right. So I just, I feel like I, I, it encourages me to just keep a positive mindset and remember to, to do the things that I actually like and want to do. So. But progress, that, that's the most important one. Just remember to actually start, like starting and actually moving on something is so much more important. I don't know how many people I know that are going to do something once something else happens that they're just waiting for. And then when that thing happens, they're waiting for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Um, you gotta, just got to start. Just just go kick it off and, and see see how it goes. You know, things always, but I feel like once you start making, start going, things kind of build up, you know, the momentum kind of piles on and, and you get progress. If you don't and you sit around waiting, then yeah, so I, I have said enough about how I feel about it. Uh, this was a super chat that popped up. Pair character punching air fist with fist bump written on his knuckles. 
You can see it in YouTube. It shows up right in a restream. It shows up as as the description. It was funny. Thank you very much. That was very cool. That was a funny one when it popped up. I was like, what is that? And then yeah, I saw it in here. It was great. Um, let's go through a couple more questions. Let's see. What are good alternatives to using Git while working with Unity? I just use Collaborate as a default. Um, if you're working small a small team or something get get collaborate SBN um, I know that they've picked up plastic SCM or merged with them or whatever it was they some partnership there I don't know if they did they buy plastic or merge or partner I think they, they, I think they, they bought, bought it, it. They bought okay it. So, yeah. yeah so that one I assume will just continue to get really good built-in support over time and it's something to look at too but git is um the reason I like Git is just that it's like an industry standard. Any company that you go to, there are going to be people there that know Git, and there's probably at least a 50% chance that they're going to use Git as their source control or something else. Um, the other one that's really popular for games, or at least was really popular for games, I don't know how it's doing now, was Perforce. I have no idea if they're still um, popular or not. But when I was at Sony, that was every everything was per force all the time and, and a couple I, have, other I have in fact um contracted for a few companies where they were using per force as their back end so it's still out there it's still being used by yeah people. it's not a surprise it was really popular and powerful it's just it was expensive at the time um they had a free plan for like up to five people and then it got really expensive beyond that too i, I have no idea what it's like now i assume it's changed dramatically since the last time i looked at it um Let's see what else we got here. That's not a question, but it was cool. So I'll pop it up. I'm glad that the video has helped you. <laughs> let's see. Let's scroll down more. Do we have it? Let's see. Oh, here's a good question for Andrew. Andrew, Infinity PBR, what assets did you find hardest to make? Find for your game. I guess it's the code ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually this for the art is this for the uh, yeah i guess when you cover art and code assets what, what i would the, the the code assets i i you know have to learn stuff to do those but i can learn just fine i'm good at learning i i, I don't mind it um the difficult thing is i do contract out for the art and um so the hardest part for me is from a business standpoint of just finding the right people to work with. I hate doing it. I hate trying to find the right person. I hate going through the motions of training someone, finding out if they're trainable to understand how I need to do things, to know how to communicate, to know whether I can trust them to get things done on time, to do it at the right quality level, uh, to not get mad when I say, hey, no, this isn't right, because it happens where people get kind of pissed off sometimes because they just want to get paid and that's a you know and so that's the hardest part but when in the actual creation of the content the the hardest ones to create are the the humanoids um you know one of the key aspects of my stuff is the blend shapes for mesh morphine so you can make characters bigger smaller um and and whatnot and that's very powerful it's very great especially for an rpg to you know character customization and stuff but in order to do that and also have wardrobe, it means that every single wardrobe, which itself is modular with, you know, so every, you know, an armor set might be really 25 different pieces that you can turn on and off. Each one of those has to have the blend shapes to match the human body and a script that I've written to drive it all. But the production of that, the workflow to produce that is very time consuming. Um, and it takes, I mean, you know, Honestly, it, it could take a, a year or more from when we start working on an armor set to when it actually gets out there, just because the people I do work with, who I'm not going to stop working with because they're great, uh, have to go through the motions, and that just takes time, um, and it's complex. And then checking it to make sure it works right, going back and forth on that. That's the most complex thing. The easiest ones for art are the creatures that are just random because nobody cares what they look like. If, if something looks a little bit off, well, that's just the creature. But if a human looks a little bit off, people are like, oh, well, that just doesn't look right. You can think uncanny, the uncanny valley. valley problem. Yeah. And then, and then if, if something like, you know, just something, people get annoyed by random things. The hair doesn't move right, or it clips in the wrong way, or, you know, an elbow bends, and it's just like a weird bend in this one animation. Those things stick out uh, because you expect something to be right 
But if it's a random creature and the elbow is just kind of stretches in a little weird way, nobody notices. Nobody notices at all. Well, I mean, I was being a bit cheeky with the answer because I knew I knew that you contracted out for that stuff. So the answer to what you found the hardest is most likely the stuff you're doing. So I, uh, I assumed yeah. it was the code. Yeah, it makes sense that humans would be the hardest. I bet the people yeah. use those as their player characters most often too, unlike Absolutely. monsters. So they're a lot pickier about them, right? Yeah, yeah. And and now you you know, in a lot of games you're going to need NPCs. So the big question is, how can I make these more unique? How can I get more humans that look different? And you know, that is a challenge in and of itself. Like, you know, with my stuff with mesh morphing, you can you can make some variety in the characters, but you can only go so far before you need another human, right? right? And you need an old man and an old woman and a younger man, a younger woman, a kid in your game. You need, you know, you need different, you need variety. And to do that, that's a whole nother uh, challenge. All of course, with interchangeable wardrobe so that they can equip and unequip in any way, shape or form for any game, because who knows if, if, if your game is that you can now hire an, a shopkeeper who has their own shopkeeper apron on, and that's an item that you can unequip and give them some armor. So you, everything has to be modular, especially when, you, when you're doing stuff for the asset store, it has to be modular to account for all these different game types. And that's different, of course, from when you're making your own game and you can say, well, yeah, the shopkeeper can make, can put on armor, but, you know, nobody can ever put on his apron. So when you put on the armor, just turn the apron off and it's not an item anymore. You know, it's no big deal. You know, you can do stuff like that. So, yeah. If you don't mind sharing, can you tell me which one's more popular, the humanoids or the monsters? Oh, absolutely. The humanoid and the dragon. Dragons, Those, right? It's all about yeah, the dragons. The, I remember you the saying dragons. Before. Originally, it was all about the dragons. In fact, Infinity PBR would not be around if it were not for the dragon. It, that carried me for years by itself because most of the most of the creatures sell once every two three months they they uh you know it's just a mushroom monster it's a really cool mushroom monster it's the best mushroom monster you'll ever ever see so when you need a mushroom monster five years from now come on back <laughs> but i got it people. yeah a lot of people do because because uh it's been around for a long time it's the one i always bring up but um but you know the creatures are just not needed when you when you when you think about okay I'm going to make a game you're going to start with an environment and a human and so the humans are now the the most uh, popular thing and the really the RPG um, character pack the one that comes with all the humanoids the goblin the horse the dragon the armor that's that's what's popular now it's expensive but it comes with everything you need to start an RPG makes sense yeah, yeah. we should link yeah. that in the description too. Sure. Good. I, I think it's one of those things. Like one of the questions uh, earlier was, if I was if I was making games, is there something that I wouldn't know about or understand until it happens? And it's like, it's funny. This is this highlights to me one of those things. Like you may decide, I want to make a game where there's a bunch of people who go to different shops and buy things, or there's like different characters in my game that are sitting at restaurants, and you just arbitrarily think I'll just need people in my game, and you don't think of how much work that is. Just to have so many different characters and models and things. Yeah. And there's a reason why there are dedicated tools that cost a fortune to do that. For example, the way a lot of big studios work is they use something, there's a, there's a product by a company called Reillusion, and they have this thing called Character Creator. I think it's version three now. Um, and effectively, it allows you to create infinite numbers of different characters and various different things, but it costs a lot of money, right? Like you're paying literally a thousand or more for the privilege of being able to generate characters. And even then, you're not done. You just have the character. You now have to go through the process of using the tools and stuff available to you to rig it and make it game ready and then do the clothing for it and then make sure the clothing fits and all the mesh stuff that, that Andrew is talking about. So the answer to it, like, is this what, what's something I don't know when I if I'm starting game dev? It's all of it. Like, if you want water in your game, how much do you know about water shaders? And if you do water, do you realize that water doesn't mean buoyant? Just because you've added water to your game doesn't mean things will float in that water. It's just a shader. It's just a texture. Now you have to what? figure out how does buoyancy work? And you have to actually write code that applies forces and applies it relative to the mass of the object and have it bounce correctly. And like everything. The answer is literally every single thing in a game. It's not for free. You have to make it. Now, there are assets and you can, you can get help with this, that, and the other. 
But the truth is, like, there will be something in any game project of any kind where you'll go, oh, and I'll just put a bow in here. Oh, wait, a bow? Where do I get a bow from? How does the bow physics work? Oh, God, it doesn't feel right. Now I have to spend forever trying to get this. And you'll, be, you'll lose weeks and months on, like, car- I don't even get in character controller. That's, that's to me, is, like, yeah. war flashbacks every time I think of any project <laughs> I've needed a character controller. And, like, so many little things. Like, oh, there, there happens to be a three-pixel gap between these two platforms. And the ray cast slides down in between the two. And you get grounding collision errors and stuff. Like, there's so many things that can just go wrong. So, a lot. I, I think this is this is the power of, of the asset store in the end for things like that. And the power of knowing what to not put in your game. Knowing what to say, okay, you know what? Like, buoyancy. You could do a full buoyancy system, or you could say, okay, the player can't really interact with it, so I don't need a full buoyancy system. Instead, I'll just animate this barrel going like this, and it kind of looks right. Okay, now it looks like there's a buoyancy system, but I'm not going to let the player ever throw anything into the water because I don't want to deal with that, you know? So you got to cut cut out the stuff that's going to, I guess, feature creep in a way, and might be really cool eye candy, but isn't going to add something to your game, but might add a lot to your dev time i think it just should be automatic you paint it blue and it's just water and it floats everything bounces in there and flows around and you go underneath and it gets murky it'll just be automatic <laughs> oh, no, you even mention that you actually yeah. have to do a whole separate set of effects for whether you're underwater you have to change the way the character controller reacts to being underwater exactly you might need to change the animations about. people make the those water systems camera. Yeah, they go yeah in, so much. They start swimming under. Uh, like, oh yeah, it's my water, my swimming system's all done. It's awesome. And then you go underwater. I just, I pictured, I've seen this with like showing it to management, right? Like showing it to producers and stuff. They're like, yeah, it all works. I can swim around. And they go underwater, and it's the same visual. And they're like, what's wrong with the water? The water is all broken. Like everything else works except for that one part of the visual isn't done yet. And yeah, it's like just uh, the whole system may as well not exist. And, and I think anybody that who's ever perfect enough. Anybody who's ever played with a game like that has noticed there's sometimes a fun trick in older games where if you stand in the waterline and you start dropping just slightly below it, the sky will flicker and you'll actually see the entire world transparent because it changes the entire rendering layer. And so sometimes you can yeah. like, like I actually I did this in Subnautica. In Subnautica, the way the water renders is different. So if you want, you can kind of cheat the game by hovering at the water's edge. And as it clips across the water, it'll make the sea, which is normally murky and hard to see through, briefly transparent because half of your sight lines above the water, half of it's below. And you can use that to like look around easier. It's it's ridiculous. I, I used to do that all the time in games. It, FPSs, MMOs and stuff. You just kind of hover along the top. You can see all the way around. It's a, a neat little trick. <laughs> All right, there was a question about code I wanted to just pop up. What are some of the most common code, core code smells you, you uh, come across? I think it's just common code smells you come across. Um, I'm kind of curious. How, how, how much time do you have? What's that? <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> I, I was just kind of curious. What, what are like the, the most obvious ones? Like the things that you see the most common or most often? Or um, just that, that are the I, most apparent, I guess. Yeah. I mean, we can go through the boring hand wavy answers and start talking about singletons and overly coupled things and all that. But I think if we skip the those ones and just jump to more interesting stuff, um, one that I see all of the time is the the problem with code behind, where people will create UI elements or some interactive thing like a shop or a menu or a something, and in the code, literally if input box has this value and button pressed and slider set to this and this percentage at this, do X. And they now tied the logic of their game. You can only buy this if you have enough money, but the way they're checking that is, is the text value of the label field correct number or something. And what they've done is- Reading the text of a label is almost always a code smell. (laughs) If you're reading the text of a label, it's probably a code smell. So in general, I find that's a big one to me because that's something I look at and go, this will change. You will change the rules for how you calculate damage or how you calculate the shop or when you're allowed to buy something, or you will hire an artist eventually and you will change that from being a slider to being a image sprite with a fill amount or something. There's something that'll change here and you will find yourself breaking your code because you specifically tied a UI component to some portion of your logic. 
So that to me is a big one that I, I look for when I'm consulting on projects. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, yeah, like I said, I think doing a lot, of, anything with reading from that UI, it should be relatively decoupled and, and separated. And if you're reading stuff out, especially out of a text label, it's a bad, generally a bad idea. And I've, not just because of um, changes, but also just the, the text in those things can be different. You'll see that like what you see in there may not match what the actual text value is. I've known when people have run into this issue somewhat recently trying to read that text value, but it's got hidden characters in there. So then they pass it up to an API and there's an error and it's unknown because they're reading it out of that field. So yeah, it's something to watch out for. But... Another version of that too, common issue with that exact same problem is rounding. Where if you're doing damage calculations between something calculates damage, multiplies by this, adds this, does other calculations, and what they're doing is they're run they're they're um they're they're using a floor or a max on that, so they're basically clipping those extra um, percentage values before they do the calculations. All of a sudden, you're getting compounding errors with your calculations. So rather than using the number, which is the calculated amount of damage or the calculated amount of whatever. They, they rounded it, got rid of the decimal places, passed it up the system. Other numbers are rounded too. So now fours are fives and threes are twos. And then when you finally combine them together to do the real calculations, the end result can be off by like as much as 20% from the original numbers it should have calculated to because you're reading from the wrong fields. So that's, yeah. that stuff happens a lot too. Yeah, some of the other ones I can think of um, that are pretty common for me are seeing lots of parameters on a method. So if I see a method that's got, it, generally, if it's got more than three, I start to get concerned. Um, if I see a lot of methods that have a lot of parameters, then I know there are some serious architectural problems going on there. Because, I mean, I've caused those problems in the past. I've seen it. I know exactly, <laughs> I, I know exactly the mistakes and problems you're going to start running into with that. Or um, seeing just very large classes. I and mean, that's one of the easiest and most obvious ones to find is when you see very few classes, but they're extremely large or they're you know, many hundreds or thousands of lines long. I've come into quite a few projects where there's multiple classes that are over 10,000 lines long and they're, there's never anything good about it. Everybody always hates those classes. Nobody likes them and nobody likes working with them because... You know, you, you know, you know, the reason is you, you make any little change and something else random fucking breaks that you didn't expect. So, yeah, those are some of the, the most common ones that I can think of. I don't know. What else mm. you got? Anything else? Or should we just move um, on? There's a lot of questions. So, yeah, well, I guess one last one is, is one of the biggest ones I look for is something called the fan in fan out problem. Uh, or it's the, or the just a fan out problem is shorthand. But this is a very clear indication of an architectural design problem, which is. Or to put it another way, it's the giant switch statement, right? It is that this is every case in my application. If it's this, do this. If it's this, do this. If it's this, do this. Um, for example, one of them that comes to mind quite heavily is in Celeste's character controller for the player. There is a switch statement with like 400 or 300 different if statements, including what the character does during the opening cutscene. There is a specific switch case in the player controller's update loop for how to handle the case where you're running the opening cutscene. Now, again, small game, but it's a small problem in its larger scale of the game. It's not a big deal. But I would say if you're doing architectural decisions where you have to literally make another if or another switch for every single possible scenario, the problem isn't adding it. People often ask, why is that an issue? If it's if A, do this. If B, do this. Why is adding if C a problem? If you forget about the, the cleanliness or how nice the code looks, the problem isn't adding the if. The problem is by adding the if, you change the code. And by changing the code, you introduce possible errors. Did you forget a bracket somewhere? Did you are you did you put it in the wrong place? Are you checking the wrong name value? The fact that you have to rewrite the code to add a new thing means you can introduce what are called regressions. You're not just risking the new features not working. You're changing the code that was there that was working and you could break older stuff. So in general, the problem with the fan in, fan out problem or any large switch case statement boils down to if you have to edit existing code to add new features, you endanger the fact that you will add regression bugs. In other words, break existing stuff. And that's where you see this in games, which often confuses people who aren't programmers. How did adding this new gun to the game 
break my ability to fast travel over here. That makes no sense. And it's like, well, actually, because the way that code works, technically during this calculation, that calls this function, which had to be updated to support the guns thing over here, which called this method. When they renamed that, they forgot to put the, the correct naming check against here, and that broke fast travel, right? Like, so this yeah. is how the biggest code smell issues from my perspective happen. It's where things are tightly coupled so that you have to actually rewrite code to add new features. Yeah, which is switch statements, which I actually did a video on switch statements and why they're not always bad. Like I think some people misunderstand that as like switch statements are always bad, but they can lead to showing you exactly what Jason's talking about, that that scenario might exist. And I mean, it, I've talked about this in the past, but it reminds me of the time when my buddy Adam fixed the feign death problem in our MMO where the monk could feign death and make NPCs stop chasing him. And there was a bug with it. He fixed it and it broke the entire crafting system for everybody that wasn't a monk because it was doing a check against the feign death thing that they didn't have. The state of that was no longer what the crafting system thought and it wouldn't let them craft because it thought they were all feigned. You know, it thought that they were all pretending they were dead and they can't craft. So it's a uh, yeah yeah exactly and i've had a similar thing kind of in, i've had stuff in enterprise where I, there was something called a chapeau which is meant to be shop that someone misspelled and it was <laughs> written, written oh. throughout multiple stuff and it was like you know what it's fine it's just a string and so i renamed the string and i broke 50 things you because a lot chapeau. of things were reading and checking for the chapeau because it wasn't because there wasn't any protection against that because it was going into the details of how that worked which gets into a whole different thing, but yeah. The Uncle Bob video on his uh, clean code one, the intro one for his course stuff, he goes over an example like that where he fixed a typo in a menu and it broke everything for all of their customers because their system was reading that menu with that typo, interpreting it, and then doing something else with it. Since it had changed, the whole thing broke. Yeah. Okay, a simple fix. I, I will everything. say though, the fun thing as well on that note, I disagree. I'm with you on this one, but, uh, but just as, as a note for people who are interested, Uncle Bob does actually consider those kinds of switch statements the equivalent of an anti-pattern, or, or he basically says switch statements almost always indicate a code smell or an issue. Again, I wouldn't almost go that always. far, but uh, yeah, I, I would say I'm, I'm more lenient. I'll happily let them go, but he considers them like if you use them, there's never a good situation realistically to really use them unless you're dealing with the difference between polymorphic dispatch and um, case statements. And you're dealing, there's like a very, very uniquely specific case. He's okay with them. And in 90% of cases, he'll tell you to do polymorphic dispatch instead. Again, I'm not that hard line. Most of the time he sees terrible, terrible scenarios and, and not, true, the, not yeah. the little like, oh, that's okay. <laughs> it's mostly like, oh yeah, that was a nightmare. And it, I, my guess is that he looks at a lot of projects and like, probably five out of 10 of the switches are totally fine. But the other five are so bad that you just don't want any. <laughs> actually, actually and i don't think i ever mentioned this but at one of the companies i worked for he actually came in to consult on a code base so oh, that was okay. fascinating yeah, he did exactly that he went in to look through this java banking api thing that was written it was very interesting huh that sounds interesting have him go through your code and tear it apart terrifying but interesting <laughs> Thank but it wasn't uh, my code, so I, I, I had no problem. It wasn't, wasn't my issue. Fair enough. <laughs> it's a little bit easier. Uh, there's a question. How do you know if you're ready to start making your first game to a point of being happy with it to be released to the public? I don't know. I'd say that you probably won't know, and you'll probably think that you are beforehand, but that's okay. You should go through and do it because you won't be really ready until you've gone through the process at least a little bit or at least once, I think. I, mean, I think that everybody kind of like waits and wants to be ready to do something before they do it, but you know, just it's better to just get started, start building it. And um, yeah, and, and, and I can't vouch for everyone else, but I will say I, I read some quote somewhere that really stuck with me. And somebody said, when am I ha when will I be happy that I can put it out that it's to the quality I want? And it was the answer was, you will never be happy. As the person who made it and saw it from scratch, you will never think it's good enough. There'll always be something. The trick is not to make it good enough that you're happy with it. The trick is get to the point that you wouldn't be embarrassed by putting it out. If you can get to that stage, that's your goal. <laughs> Don't try to be happy with it. You never will as a creator. You'll always want to change it and make it better. So just, just even be not then, embarrassed. Still put it out. Even if you're embarrassed about yeah. it, get, just get it out there and go through it because it's going to get better. And I mean, is there anything important that you're going to miss? Like, and not really. I mean, you just want to make sure that like get your game out and have other people play it. A lot of other people play it before you completely release it publicly like if you're going to do some big blast and announce it and stuff have a lot of people go through it see what kinds of issues there are because there are going to be bugs and other things that 
you didn't even notice or think about because you're if you're the only one that's seen it you really need to run a lot of people through or as many as you can show it off to people and and that um i think it's important um somebody asked how to get a tutorial for independent unity coding um i i think what they mean is how do i get to the point i don't need tutorials anymore and i, I think oh, the answer is tutorial you'll never, independent. got it got it yeah i don't think you'll ever get to that stage Practice. i still google regularly i, I will I'll still occasionally look up a Bracky's video. Because oh, I, remember... I look up stuff all the time. I yeah. think people misunderstand like when you're coding that you suddenly like know everything and remember how to do everything and remember every API. I, when I want to do something, if I haven't done it recently, I Google it. I go through a couple tutorials, watch a few videos, look at a couple blog posts. Um, even if I think I have a good idea of how I want to do it, if I'm not 100% sure, I'll still generally do that just to make sure. And um get a better idea. Most of the time I'll have a good idea of what I want to do and I'll kind of stick with it. But sometimes I just get inspiration or better ideas when I look up a way to do it or how other people solve the same problem, even if it's a problem I've solved before. Um, so I would not never worry about getting completely independent, but what you want to get to is the point where you can start a project from scratch, from empty, like you get a blank project and you're not uh, I guess, terrified or unable to start or unable to get going, right? Like you want to get to the point where you can do that. And that really just comes from, I think, practice, like going through creating that project multiple times, going through the process and building it up, starting off really small and then building up and building up and building up, making a, make a simple game that you can do in a day where you know how to do everything, build that, and then slowly ramp that up. Um, to get to that point where you can build stuff on your own, I guess. But I would, yeah, I don't think you'll ever get completely independent of not necessarily tutorials, but documentation and looking yeah. things up in general. I think if you want a really good example of this too, um, if you check out Sebastian Lag's YouTube channel, like he's way smarter than I am. And watching him do deep dives on how he builds like a cloud system or, you know, infinite generated terrain or flocking simulations, He'll go through it and he'll show you his learning process. Like he'll be working on it and then and then I didn't know how to do this. So I looked it up and I found this paper and I did this and it was stupid and it broke. And then I did this. And you can watch somebody make impressive stuff, but show you their mistakes as they go. And like if someone who's making their own from scratch GPU based cloud system is still Googling, you're going to still be Googling for the rest of your life, as, as will I. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of those things, a lot of the cool stuff that you see is all isolated and researched to do those specific things. Remember, people, everybody has to research and learn stuff but, or talk to people and bounce things off of people too. Helps a lot. Um, there's a question about developing on your devlogs on Twitch or YouTube live streams. Now, personally, I'm a fan of the YouTube ones just because I haven't seen a lot of activity on Twitch and it's not something that I, I use very actively, but I know that they, they used to have a really strong developer set up. And then it, from what I understood, at least kind of got like knocked down to a girls in bikinis setup. And then they've reintroduced a programming thing now, but I heard that it's not very popular yet, but I don't know. I guess what it was before it was an IRL tag that you could use. And that was a lot of people were using that for coding. And then it, slowly became, I guess, like hot tub parties or something. At least that's what my buddy told me who did a lot of Twitch streaming. Um, it's generally <laughs> but, a bad idea to do coding on your laptop in a hot tub. So I would say, yes, I would say it's generally a bad idea to do anything on a laptop in a hot tub. <laughs> it's probably not going to survive very long. But do you do any uh, Twitch streaming or do you just do YouTube? Andrew? I, I was doing both. I was using Restream to, to go to both at the same time. Now I'm just going to YouTube. I, I had canceled my Restream subscription, didn't start it up again. And, you know, honestly, Twitch was always the small one. Um, like I'd get okay. a viewer on Twitch, a comment on Twitch, where YouTube would have 10 at the same time, 15. So YouTube, uh, you know, it's integrated. It's got a bigger audience, it seems like. And my my sense is, I guess, what, what I'm hearing from you're saying is that the Twitch audience just isn't as into it um, watching developing as as the YouTube audience would be. Well, he'd made it sound like it was just harder to get people to even to see it, right? Like it wasn't being as promoted. But it sounds like in chat mm -hmm. that uh, people are saying that it's actually changed quite a bit and grown and that um, maybe it's 
worth checking out again. There's a tech section with game development and okay. Jonathan Blow's got a pretty popular stream. So yeah, it might be worth checking out. Maybe I'll try out um, doing a Twitch stream again sometime soon too. I have a, yeah. a channel up there and it's got subscribers. So why not give it a shot? It'd be interesting. So yeah, I don't have any personal thoughts on it yet other than I haven't really dug into it. Um, so I guess I should do that soon. Um, I, I would say if you really want to dive into this topic, there is a a guy called Harris Keller, and he basically does how to market yourself across platforms like Twitch. His entire company, Alpha Gaming, is around becoming a Twitch person, effectively. He'll talk you through the right equipment, what you need, how to use um, Streamlabs, how to do all of the, the streaming live equipment stuff. But one of the most interesting things he says is when he, he gets asked daily, what is the best way to grow an audience on Twitch? And his go-to answer is start a YouTube channel because you need to diversify your um, your your audiences. So yeah, Harris Keller, Alpha Gaming. Um, he, like This is someone who knows way, 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 uh, knows way more than me on the subject. I just try to keep an eye on it. And if someone who's doing it for a living, who owns a company doing it, tells everybody his advice is to start a YouTube channel, that's that's the best I can do. I, I just I can go by what the experts tell me. Yeah, I, that seems good to me. So having both makes sense. So yeah, I, I'll give it a try. I think and see. Maybe we'll we'll have some info on how that works. My guess is it'll still be tiny, just like Andrews, though compared. I mean, like the the relative numbers, but who knows? They're worth a shot. Um, there's a question about TDD and Unity, and what what do you think about it? And uh, do you know of any good resources to get into it? And for anybody who's not familiar with TDD, it's test driven development where you're writing unit tests or code that tests your code before you write your actual code. At least usually it's done before you write your code. You're writing the unit tests, then you're making the code to pass the unit tests afterwards. Um, Personally, I'm a fan of TDD, but I don't really try to push it too much in Unity or Game Dev because it just doesn't stick. I can't get people to buy in for the most part unless they have very specific types of projects where they're going to be working on it for many, many years and it's long running and they actually are really concerned about uh, regression errors and bugs, which unfortunately, I think to be fair, most places just aren't as concerned about it and aren't willing to dive into it and, and spend the energy on it. And it may just be that it's just not worth their their time investment. But I think that it's a useful thing to understand and to kind of get into and at the very least know about and be able to present and bring to a company in the cases that it's needed for the important stuff. But um, I don't know. What do you guys think? And for resources, I've got a course that covers it a little bit, but there's not a whole lot of stuff out there. I think I did a couple videos, a couple public videos on just unit testing and TDD and Unity. But I don't know if there's a lot of stuff out there. Have you guys seen a lot of other test-driven stuff for Unity or TDD stuff? Um, I, I would say my hot take is, honestly, I wouldn't bother. Now, this is my little asterisk here. I wouldn't bother in Unity because there is some resources. There's even an entire set of plugins. There's a test runner. There's all this stuff. But the way that works is mostly dependent on understanding assembly definitions, because assembly definitions are sort of the Unity version of DLLs and separation and that kind of stuff. And until you already know DLLs, you're going to have a hard time with it already. And then trying to separate your code out and test it and stuff, it'll be harder for you. Um, I think, in my opinion at least, I think test-driven development is the best way to write code, full stop. I think it is the most, in an ideal world, every programmer everywhere would be test driving their development because it leads to the most robust code possible. But caveat to that is not every code needs this robust enterprise scale set of stuff. And at the same time, it's also... It is harder to do. It takes a lot of like learning how to think in a test-driven way to do it. It's not easy. And in games where the code base is not going to be maintained and scaled in the same way as a 30-year desktop application, the requirements are different. So I don't think everyone needs to know how to do it, but I do think it is the end, it is the golden end result. If you want to be the best possible programmer you can be, you need to know how to do test driven development. Um, and as for how to do it in Unity, my answer is don't do it in Unity but do it outside of Unity. So the way I do it, I make class libraries. 
I test those class libraries. I do test driven development on those. And when I'm done, I have a nice shiny packet called inventory or health system or something, and I drop that into Unity. And so if that ever changes, I can test it. I can run my test automatically. I can hook it up to Git with automatic Git hooks, Git hooks and CI, and I can have those systems automatically be auto-tested and verified whenever I make changes. And then in Unity, I'm just using a thing that has been tested. If I try to test it in Unity, I've had so many headaches. It's just harder to use the systems. There's loads of ways assembly definitions go wrong. Personal experience, I love test development, but I will not do it in Unity, but I will do it a lot outside of Unity. Yeah, for me, I, I don't mind doing it in Unity so much, but I'll only limit it to things that I think actually really, really need it that are going to be around. And I mean, the only kind of project that I could justify really forcing TDD on would be something like an MMO that I planned on keeping around for 20 years. Like you said, one of those projects where it's going to be around for a very long time and the code is going to change dramatically over, you know, in an MMO, the server code is going to be completely 10 years of difference is like, it's not even the same program. So you want to have some stability and testing there. That That's one of the places where it helps and get rid of having to have an entire building of people testing every time you make a change. So that's, um, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, for, for examples at. of the kinds of systems, like for example, on two separate client projects, one of them, I had to do a console, like a command console. It's a hacking game. And you had to hack in to the cameras. And then you had to like use the cameras and move them to pick targets and then look at targets and find things. And then from that, you would type commands in to unlock other commands to let you do see more cameras and do all of that. I did that entire system just as text, just as a console app. I read the text. I used Levenstein distance to parse those text commands. I built a command system. I built um, a dropout stack to manage the undo redo stack. All of this code, everything to do with pick commands, execute commands, test it, read the text, parse it, all of that. And then when I'm done, I drop that in Unity and I hook it up to Cinema Machine, abracadabra. And I did similar things with other systems where um, I'm trying to think like undo redo is a great one. Anytime you've got time control or a inventory that switches between different items or uh, game states or something. If you're not using the actual animators and things, all of this is just flags. True or false, is on, is off, has item in inventory, can do this thing. Any quest system, larger system, if, if I'm ever contracted to do it, I will build it as a separate thing and I'll deliver it to the client with a Unity test scene with all of that code separate with the tests included. So that's just my preference. Nice. So there was a, a question here about maybe you should do a uh, video series on how to do that TDD for a class library in Unity. I think if people want to see that, they should hit the thumbs up button. And if it gets uh, a large I, I will number. say I covered it partially in a two hour stream over on Infallible Code in the middle of it somewhere, but it does need an update and I could probably do with making it a nice 30 minute succinct video. So I'll add it to my list to put on my own channel. Yeah, I think that would be a cool one people would be interested in. So yeah, if you guys want that, make sure you hit the, the like button. So. He knows that that's a, a good one. If you don't want that, then make sure you hit the like button so he knows it's a terrible one. Um. Um, there is actually one, <laughs> one small note as well as a side thing, just because it's an interesting note. Um, with test driven development, a lot of people look at it as, I don't want to get into the whole philosophy of why it's good and all the different things, but there's one, there's one secret power to test driven development that people don't appreciate, which is when you're done with test driven development, you have a test suite. You have an entire collection of tests over your code base that say, if I don't have enough money in my in wallet and I try to buy this thing and I'm the wrong class, I shouldn't be able to buy it or I should or whatever. And you get all these check, you get literally, I, you can actually do it live as well. I, I use a continuous test runner. So on a second monitor, there's green dots and the green dots will change red for anything that breaks in my code. If I change a true to a false, it instantly breaks. I can see exactly where that happened. Now, that's not just really cool and powerful, but the reason it's powerful is you have the ability to change that code. So there's this general idea of fear of code. And you, you probably don't think about it, but it's there. There's parts of your code which work. You could, don't remember writing it. You don't know why it works. But you know if you go in and like poke it a little bit, crap will break, and you're afraid to do that. And so there's a, there's a small side effect to this, which is you are afraid to change your own code. You know it should be better. You know it's messy. But you don't want to change it because you don't know all the places it'll break. If you've got a test-driven suite on your code, you can literally 
have this psychological safety and freedom to change that code. And it's so liberating to go in and just delete entire methods and rewrite them and completely refactor it and make separate classes and move stuff around. And the whole time, things are still turning green. And the minute things turn red, you stop, check what you're doing, undo something, and then redo it. You can actually you, you worry less about the design choices you make. If you write code now, you're probably trying to get it right the first time. Because if it goes wrong, you can't change it. But if you do test-driven, you can write the crappy version and then make it more performant later or make it faster or change it or whatever because you can verify the behavior still works at the end, right? That's a really big secret to why TDD is considerably better as a kind of way to approach code. Yeah, gives you that stability and safety. And it also works as a great way to have documentation, right? Because it's non-lying documentation that says, exactly what the methods do and what the objects and classes do. And if it's lying, it fails the test. So you don't have to worry mm -hmm. about it, which I, th I think is a super valuable benefit as well. Um, there's a question about saving game data in code scripts, or should they make a database or a text file to store all of the data? And I mean, I know we, we've talked a lot about how the way that you store this data should be relatively versatile, right? Like you should probably set it up so that you can save the data in any format and just kind of swap that in and out. Now, if you're going with a database, that may or may not be the case, depending on how you've set up the database. I wouldn't jump to that, though, unless you necessarily need it. If you just want to save local player data and it's a small amount of data, you can save it off in player prefs. If it's a larger amount of data, you can serialize that off into a text file, a JSON file, a binary serialized file, or something else, or you could push that off to a web service, um, or you can shove it into a, like a SQLite database or some other database. In general, though, I would recommend probably just serializing the data, save it off into a text file until you need something more complex, until because then you can view the data, you can access it, you can debug it and stuff until you're at the point where you need it in some other storage because it's either too slow or you don't want people reading it or you want to store it somewhere else. But in general, it shouldn't matter too much where you save the data. Just make it so that you can serialize out and save your data um, easily into any type of thing. Although, again, going to a database can be a little bit more complex because you, you have to map to columns and things. Um, uh, uh, general recommendation there. Um, and then you know, let's pop up one more question here. I want to get to your tips pretty soon, though, because I know you had a mm -hmm. whole nice sheet of them and I want to share them. But are there any design patterns that can handle multiple states at once? I'm doing a biome that can blend some properties depending on the climates. How can I approach that for extensible code? That's an interesting one. So it's I guess you've got two states, two biomes that are affecting the world and the environment. I assume affecting a bunch of environmental variables and stuff. And then you want to be able to blend between the two of those. My default thing that I, I would probably jump to is building a biome system that has an active biome or a set of active biomes that you blend between. And instead of ever referencing a single one, you reference that system that's doing the blending between the two or setting or b blending between the, the multiple of them if you happen to have more than two and then returning back the value. So if it's returning back the, the sky color, it could return back you know, the blended version of the sky color between the two or however many biomes or the jump speed or whatever the different things are that are in there and getting it from one system that's handling those. But I mean, do you, what's the pattern for that? Do you have a, I'm sure you have a more technical explanation there, Jason. Um, well, I, I, mine's probably kind of a, a weirder answer, um, which is I actually learned how to solve this problem in an unrelated way, which was I was looking into steering behaviors. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with that concept, but effectively it's uh, Euler integration where if you want to make AI which looks good, that represents birds or fish or some flocking type thing, um, you actually don't have to write as complicated an AI as you think. If you've got a bunch of fish swimming in and out between each other and then grouping up and splitting off, they're thinking, God, that must be really crazy code, right? Well, it's actually a really good example of small rules leading to complicated behavior. And the way you do it is you write individual little functions where all they do is interact with a vector. So if you want a character to move towards a position, you move one towards its destination, it draws a line, and you move towards that line. If you want a character to avoid a character, 
you do the inverse line and you add that. Now, if you want two characters to move in the same direction but avoid each other, all you do is multiply the two together and choose a weight. Which one do they prefer, one or the other? So what I mean is you can end up with really, really complicated swarming behaviors from a bunch of vector math and the concept of weights. So to answer your question more correctly, uh, if you're saying, how do I make this complicated blend of uh, biomes? The answer is you don't make a complicated blend of biomes. You make a biome, you make another biome, you make another biome. You add three biomes to a list, and that list has a paired number to it. The number starts with one. So one, 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 biome, biome, biome. You then go in and you change one of the numbers to 0.8 or 0.3. So now, whatever it is, you, you multiply them all up together, you divide them out till they average, and you end up getting a total where all of them add up to one. So now you have a weight. And all you do is you multiply each value by its weight. So if the sand biome is 2 or is 0.2 and the grass one is 0.8, anything you multiply by the 0.8 will be 80% more than the stuff that's the 0.2. So don't try to build a system that's a complicated multi-biome whatever. Just build biomes, put them together, give them a number, add up the numbers, divide it by the total number, and you end up with the percentage effectively of how much each one is. And then whatever value you're using, the weight, the color, the opacity, whatever it is, multiply each one by its own weighted number, add it all together, you get your correct answer. And this works for everything. This is how um, a lot of stuff in Unity is working for you. That's how the blending of the shaders and the, the, the textures in your terrain work. This is how um, a lot of behavior systems work, where they're just blending the behaviors. It's effectively just waiting. Uh, same with numbers and, and various, same with table for loot drops. Like It's all the same thing. Rather than try to build a complicated system, build separate things and just weight them. It's all you have to do. So look into look into weighted distribution. That's the that's the phrase I would Google for, and just add weighted distribution to whatever it is you're doing. That's exactly. I, that's what I was trying to get out. <laughs> the explanation I was trying to get. The the system I was saying would be the the one just to do the weighting, just to blend between those three. Like something. It could even be just its own biome that blends between multiple biomes or whatever. Whatever the the thing is that you're calling it to. But yeah, essentially weighting between those is. Definitely seems like the way to go, at least. Um, yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> Let's see. A um, couple more quick questions. Is motion capture necessary for realistic wrestling combat animation? Probably. It's my guess. You can probably buy it, right? You don't have to do it yourself. That's the yeah. difference. You could probably, there are companies out there who will literally, I actually know a guy who used to have motion capture suits. And literally, his job was you ask him what he wants, he'll hire people, he'll bring them into his giant studio. He'll have them do backflips and all the samurai stuff you want, and then he'll give you back the files. So if you're if you're making a large enough game, you don't have to make it yourself. Yeah, don't try to mocap it yourself because you're not going to be good at it. Probably it might be fun, but you're probably not going to get great mocap stuff, especially wrestling. It seems like it would be a tough one. Um, and then, what's a major reason for very long scene loading time? This varies a lot, so I really just wanted to say you should probably learn about the unity profiler get into the actual profiler and you'll be able to see exactly what's going on with your scene loading time and what's causing it i mean it could be that you've just got a lot of objects serialized that are being deserialized and loaded and it takes a long time more likely though there's something running in an awake or a start or something that's causing a big giant frame hiccup and, and causing your game to take a long time to load so i would just open up the debugger or the profiler sorry and go through the profiler while you're loading it see what's actually taking up the time and you can find the exact thing instead of uh trying to guess i, I was going to give a much cheekier answer which is the truth is with anything the what's taking a long time how, how what's the reason for a long load time you're loading a lot of stuff that's just the fact the more or you're stuff doing you it load, badly though you could be loading well, yeah, it badly but, right but I, I guess my point is like a very so i this is a funny thing because this is something that I hit a lot in, in contract client work, especially on mobile, especially in VR, especially on multiple platforms. One of the biggest, biggest issues we hit is really long load times because we're loading 8K assets and all this stuff and whatever. And the truth is, it's, it's not a very satisfying answer, but the way you make load times or at least starting load times faster, because again, little tip, if you're building for the Oculus store, they have a limit for how long something can load for the initial screen because they don't leave people in that lobby where it's uncomfortable. So the game has to at least load quickly, and then it can load slowly internally, but as long as the initial scene loads in. So they'll actually recommend you have an initial scene to load into, 
and then load your stuff afterwards. Is that like but one second or how long? I can't remember the exact number, number but it, they, they, the they don't give you much. Low. They're even yeah, they lower on PlayStation. Much. You get to like yeah. Yeah, PlayStation and they're extremely tight on the amount of time you can spend. Yeah, it, it's it's not it's not a very uh, it's not a very friendly amount. But but I guess the 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 trick that we use a lot, which works very well, is you just simply don't use all of the awake functions. It's very tempting to have awake and load loads of assets in and awake. If your game gets big enough that you've got a lot of stuff that needs to load in at the start, start looking at streaming. Load in what you need around you, and then once your project starts, fire off a color routine or a thread or something, and start doing more loading. Load like the room or the area, and then start loading in the stuff you need after the fact. So the truth is, if you want to make loading times a lot shorter, stop loading as much stuff, basically. Yeah, or to delay the loading of that stuff, essentially. Yeah, yeah, you like, still have to load it, but at least loading, don't load it at the do start, it, do it right? Later. Yeah, yeah. Do it, do it while the game's already already running. But yeah, Profiler will tell you what those parts are to, to move out. Um, another question just for you, Jason. Do you think it's a good time investment to do more data-oriented design, separating out your data and functions, or sticking, sticking with uh, OOP for indie game developers? And here, I, th- I think that it's more of... Um, because o- OOP and data separation are not necessarily exclusive, but I think it's more about, do you think it's a good time investment to completely separate out your data objects from your, essentially your, your acting objects is the way it sounds. At least that's the way I'm reading um, the question. I don't know how you're seeing it. I, I would say, and this is, this is more personal opinion rather than anything else, but I would say in the same way that I think test trend development is the correct right end goal way to code, which I don't always do, but I believe it's the right way. It's the golden example. I think in truth, for games especially, uh, data-driven and data-oriented design is probably the right answer. I think in future, it's probably the most efficient, better way to do it. But I am an object-oriented programmer. I always have been. I'm, I prefer it. I'm more comfortable there. And I... I find that from a from a design and architecture perspective, you end up with an easier to maintain and work with code base with OOP over a lot of the data oriented stuff. But um, I will say, I think it's valuable to know. But the truth of the matter is, and this comes back to way at the start for the original question: Are you, if you're making a salad, are you making a salad or are you building a farm? Right. Like the truth is, if you have to take a detour from making your project to go on a journey to build a farm, to grow the vegetables, to build your salad, then maybe just stop, go back and figure out what your goal is and make a salad, right? So I, I do think it's a valuable thing to learn. I think especially with the data-oriented stack and the way Unity is going, I think more games will go that way. I think it's the most performant. It'll scale better, but I don't think it's necessary. If you're an indie, just make a game, use the tools you have. OOP will be easier to learn, understand, and use, I would say, because it's very, if you're mathematically minded, you'll find the data-oriented stuff easier. But for most programmers, I find they tend to lean logic-minded, where it's more about conditionals and branching and statements and objects. I find most people find it easier with OOP. And I would say stick with it unless you literally have a eke-out, super-performant you know, reason you have to go data-driven. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, there's one point, though, uh, that I think people could somewhat use, which is that even if you're in OOP, your data doesn't necessarily need to sit on those objects, right? One of the things that I'm a big fan of, depending on the game, is having another data object where all of the stuff that is related to that object or all of the state related to that object is stored. And that could be a scriptable object or a struct or a class or just something that's holding that data that's separated and then usually bound up to it so that I can do stuff with that data independently and not worry about the complexity of the class. That way I can serialize off the data for whatever the thing is, the player, the NPC, the weapon or whatever. Um, I can serialize that data off without having that, that big giant class and I can kind of deal with and reason with the data somewhat separately. From the object but that doesn't require a giant switch to to dots or giant mindset yeah. swap it's just thinking of separating out that data into a sub object of your class um, i think or- that's a good point to bring up is that they're not mutually exclusive it's kind of a silly argument and you'll see this a lot online is oop dead versus is oop the future versus is functional the future all these like ridiculous posts and the truth is that's like saying 
we've invented the screwdriver. Is the hammer dead? It's like, no, that's a stupid unrelated. Like, they are different tools that have different benefits and strengths and they're not mutually exclusive. And I find that you can really just apply whatever rules or tools are helpful to what you're doing. Um, if I was doing something that was very config oriented, like it was a, a card game or some larger combat thing with a giant matrix of data, then most of that will probably live data oriented because that, that allows designers to work with it outside of me effectively. Um, so I, I would apply the right tools to the right job, right? And there are design patterns which will let you work in a more data oriented way. The flyweight pattern, for example, is specifically designed around minimalizing how much work you're doing by having a single representative object that is this piece of data for multiple things. So there's just research it, do your homework into it and, and apply what works for what you need. So this question was about uh, building non-game apps, which I know is something else that you've, you've done quite a bit of. I've done some myself. So what are your opinions on building applications that aren't necessarily games with Unity, mobile and desktop apps mostly? Is this something that's common from your experiences? And I think across the board, the answer is going to be yes. I've seen just as much non-game stuff as I have game stuff, whether it's mobile, um, some VR, AR stuff, automotive stuff, all kinds of different unity use cases that are not games i for me it's been probably 50 50 on the things that i've seen uh, professionally what about you guys i'm up to 85 i'd say 85 percent of the stuff that i do slash see in unity is not games okay yeah so there's definitely a lot right and i'm sure you've seen plenty of non-game stuff right I've I've not not directly well I mean I guess a little bit I know you know things like Disney will might use them for for in park experiences we talked about that last week I think uh, potentially for that I know I've done a couple non game apps um, you know one I was working on that didn't get released one that did get released for a while it's no longer available but it was non game um, I think the power is 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 there for Unity to be used in all sorts of different apps. It's a little heavier, I suppose, than doing it natively, most likely. But um, I don't think that's an issue for most use cases. I think now. it's still light enough that it doesn't make a difference. And the yeah. heaviness is just bringing in power. Yeah. So um, the, the next question was, will you have a course that covers client to server architecture with focus on the dedicated server side? Um, maybe. I'm not completely sure. I mean, it's something that I'd like to do sometime in the future, but it's one of those things that there's just a, it's a very niche type thing. There's not a lot of demand. There are very few people that are interested in it. And most people want their own um, very custom set. They're all building very different things, but I might make at the very least a video on dedicated um, client, client server games and stuff. And I'm also going to do a, I'm working on an RTS kind of for fun and some streams on that. And that will probably end up with some dedicated server side stuff too. Assuming that I keep going with it, that stream and series might end up full of uh, dedicated server RTS code. So possibly, but I, I don't know about a course on it just because it's one of the things where you've got to be very opinionated on how you set it up. Um, let's see, what was there anything else? Oh yeah, somebody actually mentioned having a video on that and um i don't know should we jump over to tips i i'm sure there are a couple more questions that are um, up, but yeah i, I just want to find like one ridiculous number of tips oh you got one okay. i just want to find one reference to because that last comment i, I just find it funny because there's something i can i can demonstrate with this um let me see if i i'm going to send you a link here jason oh okay I'll are you not you able to one. screen share on here um, I don't know if it works for me. <laughs> I, I, I usually just switch the OBS in a second to demonstrate it that way. Oh, okay. Um, All good. But I'll, I'll just send you these two first as a thing. So with the question, can you use Unity for apps? Um, so anybody who has an Android phone, you probably recognize this menu. Well, that's not Android. That's Unity. I For a client project, I just made the menu. And now, granted, I cheated. I just took the one that was there. Um, I use it as a reference, and then I found assets using my asset provider. I matched the color palette, and I made this, and I can now dynamically build menus. It was it was for a mobile phone in a VR application, so this is on a mobile phone. But the point is, like the fact that it's Unity is invisible, right? Like it's just a thing with buttons that looks like a menu. And for a second example of that, I posted a second one, which was me for a different client. They asked if we could do something that looks a bit like Instagram. 
Um, and so if you click that second one there, this is my fast ounce application, which is a terrible pun, but it's effectively me. I've never used Instagram before this. So I just brought it up on a second, second stream and I just Dream made canvas out of it. And I just did a basic version of it, right? And I use data generators and this uses tasks to use web APIs that pull down images randomly and pull down faces randomly and use from uh, this person doesn't exist.com. There's all of this different stuff and it's just fake apps. So this may not be a great example, but this is me doing mock-ups to demonstrate to clients of what could be done for certain applications they wanted. And so the short answer is yes. And this is just mobile. I could do the same thing and demonstrate desktop apps and touchscreen apps and VR stuff and AR. Like I've done lots of, most of the stuff I do falls into this vague category of things that aren't actually games. Yeah, I, uh, I just love this. I'm waiting for uh, Instagram to come after you now. Competition, <laughs> fast downs. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was. I enjoyed that name too much. It was stupid. But <laughs> I did enjoy it. Oh, oh actually, one of the things we we're talking about this is, is one last one. Actually, sorry, here's one more. You might get a kick out of. Okay. We were talking about the console thing. So, as part of one of the client projects, I asked them what um, what did you want for the algorithm for searching, and I said how do you want the autocomplete to work for the console app? So I made this little test application, which was just a way to demonstrate various ways to do autocomplete algorithms. So oh, okay. it's got a, I picked the most, the, the thousand or the hundred most used words in the world. I populated a text file with it. You can drag text files in to change it. And then as you type in words, you can press previous and next to switch the algorithm. And it will do different things, which will be allowing more or less leniency for whether you have to spell it correctly or whether it, it has to be exact or does it need uppercases or can you use Levenstein distance to be close and whatever. And this just was a way to demonstrate to the client, here's some options, pick one, we'll use the one you want. I've given the name on the left. Um, and so, yeah, I use app type stuff like this all the time. That is cool. It's neat. I like that idea, just giving them the, the different options and showing them and having them actually try it out before you implement without having to go through and put it in the whole the whole project. So that is definitely cool. All right, should we jump over to your tips? Yeah, let's see We're if this have works. To tip you. I have to make yeah. you big. Okay, let me let me just open up my uh, thing here. Um, see if this works. Dun, dun, dun. Um, all right, so this is a, a, a new test of, of my my setup for the tip. But I thought I wanted to try and do it visually this time and see if it works. So the first tip uh, comes courtesy of someone who's actually in the chat, or at least was earlier, Nick. Uh, and he mentioned something very interesting, which is when you're doing input boxes, one thing that can often be a problem is how long it is, right? So if you ever use Text Mesh Pro and you've done that thing where it like overruns the text into the next bar, it gets really frustrating. So to demonstrate that, you're, you have a text box, but the text overruns to the next one. Well, here's the thing. They are both six characters long, or in this case, but the W's overrun, but the other ones don't. Because if you're not using a monospaced font where every character is identically sized, you will it'll be a longer string than you think if you're using W's than if you're not using W's. So if you're testing an input box to make sure it works or for the number of characters you want, use W as your character. That'll that'll be the maximum possible width across the length of that string. Makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Capital um, W's. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, this one is just a small tip. It's more of a plugin you can get for Writer, but I, I find it quite interesting. Is you can view heap allocations. So uh, there's a little yellow underline you'll sometimes see on on whenever I share my screen, and it will tell you whenever you're doing things like closures or captures. This is getting into a whole different topic about performance, but a lot of people think that because we talk about clean code and operator code that we don't care about performance. We do, we just don't think it's the reason to make decisions uh, in a lot of cases. You can always optimize later, but it is worth being aware when it happens. So if you install this plugin, Heap Allocation Viewer, it'll give you a nice shiny underline to let you know you have caused a allocation here. And it's something that makes it easier. You don't have to run the profiler to go hunt them down. It's just something you can see in your code whenever things are happening. So this is just a, it makes it easier to find those issues. 
That one um, looks cool. Is that not installed by default with Ryder? You have to go in and I, just pop it on there? I don't think so. I mean, I, I remember okay. I used to install it myself. Maybe it is. I'm, maybe it is uh, now, but it wasn't before. I'm not 100% sure if it is. I'm just well, curious. either way, make sure it is because it's, it's, it's really valuable for Unity. Um, yeah. So is that Cognitive Complexity plugin I'm using by Matthias, but I'm not, that's a, we're not going to cover that right now. This one is going to be the coolest. I think people are going to really, really dig this one. So I've talked before about how the file system, it isn't, it isn't folders. It looks like folders. It acts like folders. It's not folders. It is, in fact, a database that you can search. And so you don't need to structure your folders correctly. And to really drill this home, I built this example where you can populate arrays and scriptable objects automatically from your asset directory. And so here's a little test script called Sword Shop. And imagine this is some UI, which is a bunch of icons for swords, but there's specific icons in my project that are thumbnail icons, which are smaller resolution with a particular thing. And I want to populate this list with every sword icon that is a thumbnail. And so I can ask this question of my code, load all textures in the asset slash art slash weapons directory with sword in its name that are labeled as thumbnails. And so I can write this, which makes a nice little editor button for me. And what it'll do is it will search my asset database, perform this query as if you typed it into the search yourself, return all of the GUIDs for those elements, convert those GUIDs into asset references, and then populate the array for me. So if you understand this syntax, you don't need to think about all of this, dragging it in yourself manually. You can start to reason about and automate some of this stuff. Now. As for how I did that, slightly out of scope, I'll show you the code, but it's not something I want to cover. This is the basics for how you do that. You effectively um, find the assets. And I, there's a prefix here, asset database dot. I'm using a static reference so you don't see it. But all of this exists under the editor dot asset database namespace. But again, that's not the point of this example. Just learning the syntax is the point. You can say, find assets, select them, go into the asset path, then take the asset path and load it to type T check the ones which aren't null because load asset of path can return null, cast it to array, populate the array. And that leaves you with this one back here, a button fills the array of textures that fit an exact folder with an exact label with the exact type. And you can imagine how much easier it is when you're updating your project and you could have like editor tools and helper functions and you don't have to manage all of this yourself. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and last one isn't as fancy as that, but it's a, it's a small one I quite like. Um, if you're easing, you're doing your standard easing, the, the two options normally we've talked about before, you can use coroutines and animation curves. And you can just write your own curves and then pass the value into the curve and lerp it. That's fine. But oftentimes, I don't know about you, but I find mostly I use ease in, ease out, ease in out. And it's kind of annoying having to go and reuse the same two or three things. The better way is usually do tween, which gives you all of the benefits of pooling your tweens and doing all that stuff, but you don't need all of that stuff. Realistically, the actual algorithm for easing is really, really simple. And mathflerp does the basic, take two values, interpolate between it. But if you want to apply, the only ones you ever really need. In fact, the Google um, material design uses two curves for like all of it. The entire, all the swishy animations on your Android phone, there's two animation curves normally. Um, so if you have ease in, ease out, ease in, out, they cover 90% of use cases. And they look like this. They're not that big. Ease in is just this, then ease out, and then in outside. So th these three here will cover the basics of 90% of animations. And you can then just pass a value in and interpolate between the two, pass in time as your third value, and you're done. So if you are looking to do easing and you don't want to bring in an entire library or a requirement like Dootween for a client project, but you also don't want to have to require animation curves for everything you're doing, these three in a helper function is a lot easier. And that's it. That's my, that's my tips for today. I think Jason's still out. Jason, but yeah. Jason went, ran away. Your tips were, he had to go try them right away. <laughs> I got to do the Ws. Those those were uh, uh, pretty good tips. The the W one is is one of those simple comes in handy, good idea thing to do, for sure.
Yeah, yeah, it's one of those ones that's like, I hadn't heard of that before. It's like, ooh, I'll, I'll write that one down. That's valuable. <laughs> oh, people are asking what the what the tool is. Fine, I'll just, I'll show it briefly. That's not the point. I, I don't want to drill down to this. Um, I even actually say it in the video on my channel that I'm not covering this right now. But this is actually, um, it's not about code snippets. This is a tool um, that I'm using a lot now called Obsidian. It's actually, it's a, it's a project management tool that has all of this, like, graphs of all of the stuff I'm doing. I can open up... Um, video ideas I have and various different things. And um, in that case, it's a presentation and it uses um, markdown syntax. And so anything that I demarcate with these triple lines, I can open it up as a presentation, uh, which does that whole thing that we saw earlier. Mm. Um, but you can also do all sorts of other crazy stuff. I've talked about this at length and anybody who has chatted with me in any discord has heard me talking about how much I love Obsidian. It's the kind of most important management tool I use for all of my stuff. That's pretty cool. Oh, you're muted. Did I miss the last tip there? I had to, I had to um, step away for half a second. They're was getting it good easing? The, yeah, the last one was just easing. You, you basically, oh. uh, you, you can use, um, I, I, I wrote the algorithms for the easing curves. It's just, just a couple of lines. Nice. Yeah, I was with that, uh, get all method you caught me off guard for a second there i thought that already existed i was like wait is this a nope, method that's built a, in ah, extension it's method. a fancy little extension method that uses three different functions and some link expressions and ties it all together yeah that's super handy there's also the um i think we've talked about it before the quick search the control k it lets you do do a lot of quick editor searching totally unrelated to what you were talking about but just on the whole well, very loosely related on the whole searching thing. It's something that I've been trying to get used to using in Unity. I use it in, in Rider and stuff. And it was some kind of thing I was used to using in Rider, but not in Unity. And I'm trying to get into the habit of hitting that when I want to find things that I'm not sure exactly where they are and, and using that quick search option as well. Well, those are cool tips, though. I, I was glad uh, you put together that little sheet there. That was kind of cool. I feel like I want to do the same. I've been lately just building up a Milanote board of tips and stuff, but I, I want to put together like a little presentation like that. I think that would be neat. Kind of, well, kind you of know stuff. me, I recommend Obsidian. It's been very helpful for me. Yeah, it's on my list of tools to dive into. I just haven't had a chance to really get into it yet. All right, well, um, any other things you guys want to talk about? Or Andrew, you got any tips you wanted to share? Stuff to share this week? Uh, I have no no strong tips. Uh, I guess one thing I did learn that's that's been just a nice quality of life thing. Uh, Jason and another fellow on a live stream taught me that uh, the debug console has a little context menu, and you can make the default lines smaller, so you can choose to only show one line instead of uh, two. So if you're like me and you use the debug logs a lot when coding, it's check on stuff. Um, Making it one line instead of two just it means you can see more stuff. And, and that's been a great helper for me. So you can kind of understand what, what's um what's showing in there. And that's this yeah. option right here in Unity. Is my screen sharing? Yeah. Yep. You go to log entry and you can just change the number yep. of lines that you see. You see just yeah. one line there or go up to maybe you're a weirdo and you want to see 10 lines. You, know, you want to see a giant I stack. I guess the, the side tip to that is always click the buttons and see what, what the options are there. I've never clicked that button in like eight years of using Unity. I've never actually clicked that. So, you know, click buttons and see what happens. Hey, you can even turn on and off the stack trace logging, whether or not it keeps the whole stack trace interesting. I don't know why you would want to, but I mean, there must be some technical reasons. Maybe you want to turn it off for your regular debug logs because they're spamming and they're slow. Huh. Oh, that actually made me think of there. There's one more, actually, one more tip. Okay, let's hear it. Um, so this is something I, I was talking to to Andrew about. So because he, he mentioned on on the stream that that stream that he was talking about, where he was doing um, that with the console, I noticed he was also doing random um, voices from a from a collection, and they the problem with random is random is truly random, and well, I don't want to get into true random, whatever. It's it's random enough that you can get the same thing multiple times in a row. And if you've only got three or four elements in your array, that's relatively common. You're going to get repeats in a way that's sort of psychologically unsatisfying. So what I was demonstrating is that you don't have to deal with that problem. So 
on my um on my Kofi page, I've started putting little articles and PDFs. And again, little, little spoiler, these are just um my obsidian clips. So I actually have here. Um where's my random i don't think i have it here uh i don't have it in this one but basically this, funny enough these, these are just snippets from my obsidian that i've merged together into pdfs there's a nice export button and what i've done is i've started writing these little articles that are tied concepts so this is just an export from my obsidian of some topics i was thinking about around that problem so if you have a bunch of stuff that you want to randomly pick from an array rather than writing the code out every time i just demonstrate briefly um you can make how to do it how to basically make it a bit nicer, how to use extension methods. But then I moved down into the idea that the problem with random is you're going to get these repeated se sequences. And so what you can do is as you start to, to kind of make this a bit fancier, you can use the Fisher Yates shuffle, which will effectively reshuffle your collection in a way where it moves the unused elements to the end and shuffles it to crop. I don't get it. It's, it's here. You can read it. But the, the point is, if you want to have a collection of 10 items and it will go through the 10 items randomly, and then start again, you can do that with a relatively small amount of code. And it makes it a bit nicer than randomly picking stuff that could lead to the exact same thing three times in a row. Um, so that's up on my Kofi for uh, for supporters. Well, and that's linked down below too. So everybody can go check it out along with your first video. Everybody check that out. And I also, um, I put the link down there for your character bundle andrew i noticed that it was on sale too so when i pulled it up i saw that it's on sale right now that that might actually be an upgrade price the ui for the asset story will show an upgrade price as the same as on sale so if you have a previous package that's in that bundle you'll get a oh discount. okay that must yeah. be what it is because it showed us the full price and then it showed me a, a 21 percent discount which i assume yeah must just yeah. because of some of the other packs that i already own from that on this account but yeah, yeah that explains something i was talking to my friend nick earlier and he was like oh this thing's on sale for eight dollars that's great and i looked at it and went it's costing me 40 and it, we were just really <laughs> confused as to how that so that that explains it he must have some of those because you're from, irish yeah <laughs> but yeah that does irish happen price. yeah okay that that makes sense so that's linked down below if anybody wants to check it out i, I would definitely recommend it it looks really cool i mean i've got a lot of those things on there i don't know why i'm only getting that much of a discount though Unfortunately, the asset store will only give you one discount. They'll give you the biggest discount, but I can't uh, right now. Oh. The bundle system won't like take into account everything that you have previously. That right. makes sense. I was thinking, like, yeah. I I'm sure I own more than just that that tiny portion of Infinity PBR stuff. Like, okay, yeah. that that makes sense. Yeah, I I probably have almost everything on there. Very cool. And then I also linked um, Andrew's stream. So if anybody wants to just kind of follow along and you're doing some of that ability stuff still, right? Andrew, the spell system working, things that we we're yep, working, working on the spells. Already. Last night, I got to the point where I can cast, but nothing happens. So okay. I'm going to start actually doing some casting and likely fix bugs along the way because I'm sure some will pop up. So you want to see, yeah, what that's actually like to have a real working spell system in the code from it. Um, Join the Andrew stream. I linked it in there, and I assume Jason's story will probably happen in chat, and I'm, I'm sure I'll be in the chat too, in and out, just saying hello and, and watching and seeing as you build out this spell system. Should be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, that's linked down below and in the chat as well. And I don't know, anything else you guys want to just briefly talk about before we wrap things up? I know we're a little early, but I think we kind of hit everything already for today. Well, that's, someone has to say like and subscribe, right? That's, uh, that's oh, the rules. without a doubt. If you haven't already hit the like button and subscribed and just copied the link and pasted it onto Facebook or something, please do that. Um, even if nobody's looking, it, it helps. Like YouTube just looks at the number of times things were linked externally and it, it likes it a lot. So if you don't mind hitting the like button, sharing, it does make a big difference. And also just check out all of the, the stuff down below. There are lots of cool things down there. there's a couple sales and other things linked um um cool and stuff. as mentioned i i am now starting my channel i now have a little bit of free time as a result of a contract ending and i looking for ideas so if if this gave you any inspiration or i didn't elaborate on something or we covered a topic but not as well as we should if you put comments under this video i do read all the comments it'll give me an idea of what videos to make next because I could make lots of videos. I just don't know what to cover. So if there's something you want to see, let me know. Yeah, that's a really good idea. 
just drop comments down below and get it figured out. And I'm really excited to see what Jason's done too. Also, I guess uh, since Andrew is not starting for about a few minutes, me you got time to go in and watch Jason's video before he gets started. So absolutely, <laughs> I won't start for half an hour. So about a half hour, yeah. yeah. Everybody's got time. You can go queue up the video. Um, or so queue up 15 the minutes. So yeah, should be should be easy enough. Go watch Jason's video on how to get started on a project, and then go through and copy Andrew making an an RPG. Yep. All right, with your fresh project. All right. Well, anything else you guys wanted to say before we uh, say goodbye to everybody? Huh? All right. Well, with that, I guess I will wave and say hasta. Bye, everybody. We'll see you again um, next Sunday. I'll probably drop some more videos sometime soon. Um, somebody asked where to contact me. Just send me an email, jason at game.courses, or um, hop onto the webpage. There's a link on there. And then, um, yeah, I think that's it. So thanks again, everybody. We'll see you all uh, next week. And uh, have fun coding and making games. And uh, bye. <laughs> Don't forget bye, to everyone. like and subscribe and all that stuff, too. <laughs> all right. <laughs> cool. Now, bye. I got to find my, my goodbye button again. I always look at this. Oh, here's a different one. We'll say goodbye with a weird outro number, a countdown one. <laughs>